sponsored by Yes Securities. We extend a warm welcome to each one of you. OJUS, as you may know, is SPJMR's flagship management and cultural fest and is one of the largest and most prestigious B-School fests in the country. This year, despite the strike of the third wave and the ongoing pandemic, we have seen a record-breaking 14,000 plus registrations across 25 events with participants from more than 100 B-Schools and undergraduate colleges all over India. From the despair of a disconnected, illusory world to coming together in a post-pandemic reality, a promise of change and hope marks the 14th edition of OJIS. Handing over to Ritik. With mergers and acquisitions being the hot topic trending in the news and media channel, this year we thought of incorporating the same into our management fest with our event Make or Break, for which all of you are present here. The event provides all the participants with an opportunity to step into the shoes of an investment banker and use their financial acumen and business knowledge to make or break the best of deeds. Speaking of investment bankers, we have an esteemed panel of judges from the financial world of investment banking. We have as a first panelist, Mr. Aman Agarwal, who works currently as an associate in the investment banking division at TC Advisory India. He has previously worked with PwC Advisory as an experienced associate in the management consulting division. Then we have Mr. Rachit Rajkiriya, who is currently working as an analyst with HSBC India investment banking team. Is part of the coverage team involved in origination to execution of QIPs, MA, IPO, and private equity transactions. And our last panelist is Mr. Indreen Gua, someone with whom I share two alma maters. He is currently working as an investment banking analyst at Goldman Sachs. All three of our judges are alumni of the SP Jamra batch and they are chartered accountants. So, yeah, marking the events first year. Make or Break received participation from 500 plus students embarking its journey of a premier event, giving participants a chance to put their valuations, growth assessments, and appraisal of future synergies to test. After an event spanning two rounds, the first one being Mind Merger, the quiz, and Deal Maker, the executive summary submission round, we are finally left with the seven fi national finalists. Now, I would like to move on to the debriefing of round one. For the final round and position, I request all the teams to decide on their team captain who shall be responsible for the voting. It can be the D2C captain or the team could mention someone else. After this debrief, I shall be sharing a Google form comprising eight pages, one page for each team and the introduction. So the form is very self-explanatory, it consists of a rating that shall be incorporated into the judge's final sheet while uh, scoring. So please make sure you uh, do the rating correctly. As far as the timings are concerned, each team shall be given eight minutes to present, followed by seven minutes of Q&A. Uh, we shall uh, inform at the end of eight minutes that uh, we shall leave a text on the chat that eight minutes are over. So please make sure you adhere to the timing. The voting needs to start as soon as the presentation ends and it needs to be done within four minutes, after which the form shall get closed temporarily. I request all the team captains to open the link and get back to us if there is any trouble. Uh, I'll just share the link. Just a minute. Yeah, it's there. With that, I would like to close the inaugural phase of the final round of Make or Break. I am sure all the national finalists are now ready to present their business ideas to our esteemed judges. So uh, if we could have a word or two from the judges, it would be really nice. Uh, if uh, the judges want to speak a word or two for the participants, just to motivate them. Rachel, do you want to go? Okay, no, no, I would say all the best to the participants looking forward to it. Uh, they'd have a chance looking at the presentation and stuff, but would like the participants to present it and get their views on that. So all the best. Yeah, yeah thank you guys. Um, yeah, expecting a good competition. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, even I didn't have a chance to look at the presentation. But yeah, I mean, as we go through it, maybe uh, we'll have a chance to deep dive and ask a few questions as well. So yeah, all the best guys. 
I I did manage to have a look at one or two presentations. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was quite impressive. And uh, yeah, hoping to hear from you further. So, while I correct the uh, the error that has been displayed in the form, I guess we'll start with the presentations. So I wish all the best to all the national finalists from Team Ojas Forty. So let me call upon our first team, Team Equities, to present their business solution to our judges. All the very best, Team Equities. Thank you, Bhuvan. Um, so I'll start by sharing my screen. Is it visible? It's visible. Yes, we can start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So we are Team Equities, and we are here to present make and uh, make and big challenge for Tesla and New. Now coming to industry overview, uh, electronic vehicle has a. Uh, Marty, can we move to the next slide? Uh, electronic vehicle has a very impressive growth rate. Global industry is set to grow at a target of twenty three percent and set to reach one hundred one thousand four hundred fifty six point six eight billion US dollar industry in twenty twenty six. China, which is one of the major market after US and Europe, is set to grow at a target of 31 percent and reach 648 billion industry, which will be approximate 60 percent of the global industry. Currently, EV industry consists of the 65 percent of hybrid electric vehicle and 25 percent of battery electric vehicle and minor test 10 percent of PhD. We have also shown how EV has grown as an industry from 2010 to 2020 while analyzing the journey. Cost rationalization, infrastructure, and laws and regulation can be seen as the most important milestone. Technology which can reduce cost, government regulation, the ability of people to buy more, more from fast changing market, and emission regulation, emission regulation as a major growth driver for the industry. Now moving to the Tesla. Tesla works in mainly two segments autom automotive uh, and energy generation and storage. It involves in design, develop, manufacture, and set high performance for electric vehicles. Tesla has a major share of 18% in the global market with major competitors like Volkswagen, Saif, EBYD, Stellantis, etc. Tesla has shown stellar financial performance with revenue growth of 73% and a operating margin growth by 12.1%. US is the major market for Tesla with 50% of the revenue coming from there and rest from China and others. New can provide so many benefits to Tesla. Supply chain infrastructure near in China, easy market access to China, and most importantly, new best in class battery as a service and automation driver as a service, which can also be used in India and other places for Tesla so that they can acquire major market. New will also reduce intense competition between both and cost and also help to reduce cost by local procurement. Now, coming to the new, new is a leading manufacturer of premium smart electric vehicles. New differentiate itself through innovation such as battery swapping technology and autonomous driving technology. New revenue has stayed a target of 48% over three years, and its vacant sales has increased over 100% in the third quarter. Currently, the company is not making operating profit and hence not generating any returns. Currently, New has 4% market share in China, while other major competitors are expanding Great Wall Motor, Lynch, and Co., etc. New will increase the as new has not been profitable and depend on outside resources for scaling production. So is new trend, new trend to market it with only 5% market share and then facing intense competition. Tesla will provide access to international market and also new will be able to use manufacturing facility of Tesla. Over to you, Mansi. Thank you, Vedika. So we'll move to Neo's valuation. So we avoid we have used relative valuation to value Neo. We avoided DCI because only past three years of data was available, and because of initial stage of company as well as the industry, we have seen irregular jumps in the revenue of over hundred percent. So we looked at the peer companies of Neo, which have similar business and market capitalization and Neo, and we took EV by sales and EV by gross profit as our multiples because it has negative EBITDA and negative net profit currently. So using our EV by sales of 8.97, we arrive at an EV of 60,542 billion and using EV by gross profit of 50.85, we arrive at an EV of 65,393. By averaging this out, we arrive at a valuation of NEO as 62,968.17 uh, dollar billion. Moving on to the next slide. 
Talking about the deal structure, we are proposing a share swap deal. Tesla will give shares uh, in exchange for promoters stake in NIO at an implied EV with a premium of 30% for synergies. The synergy premium is accredited to revenue and cost synergies arising out of Tesla acquiring strong foothold in China and distributing battery swap tech, tech across the markets. The current market price of Tesla is 923 USD and implied equity value of NIO is 42.16 USD, a 78% upside from its current market price. NIO will transfer 51% of promoter holding to Tesla and after computing for number of shares to be exchanged, we arrive at 51% of NIO's worth is around 4.1% of Tesla's and 45.2 million share Tesla shares will be transferred to NIO promoters. Post deal, Tesla will become first EV manufacturer to sell 5 lakh EVs in a year. The product portfolio will widen and it will be able to serve markets neighboring to China effectively. Tesla's market share in location other than China will increase because of the low price offering of battery as a service model. News full slack autonomous driving will aid Tesla's research and development. This acquisition will be in line with Tesla's plans to enter India with a manufacturing facility. And News BASS model will help Tesla's Tesla gain strong foothold in markets like India, where charging is charging infrastructure is lacking and cost is an important factor. We can see the change in ownership of NIO and Tesla due to this deal. The motor holding of will fall in Tesla will fall to 15%, and the company structure of NIO will be simplified with only two owners. Talking on ESG front, NIO will be gaining better ESG practices of Tesla and improve categorical as well as the overall score. Uh, moving on to the synergies. Okay, so because of the following synergies, we recommend this deal. First is that revenue. Chinese customers are seen to have a preference for domestic brands. NIO and Spang's combined share in sales in China rose from 5 to 8% and Ch uh, Tesla share fell from 16 to 8 12%. So, and also China is a home to 50% of the global EV market. Hence, having a strong foothold in China is very important. And Tesla and NIO can also cross-sell their models across different geographies. Second, second is that China is looking to consolidate its EV market because of large number of small players. Hence, competing against these combined large players of China will be difficult for Tesla. So uh, with this acquisition, it will be able to develop a strong foothold in China. Next is that we have seen that one of the biggest USP of NIO is its battery as a service model. NIO, what NIO does is it replaces the upfront cost of 70,000 RMB battery with a monthly fee of 980 per month, which is a battery subscription model and, and the battery is chargeable, swappable and upgradable, which a customer can use according to the capacity. Also, Tesla can leverage this breakthrough in its own, own models developed by it. Next, that, next synergy that we see is that aid and distribution. Both of the companies follow a direct-to-customer approach and Tesla will be able to get access to 38 new, uh, new houses globally uh, and add it to its existing network with this acquisition. Lastly, NIO has rolled out its pilot for autonomous cars and Tesla is also working towards making the uh, launching the cars which are self-driving. So both of them can combine the full stack in-house capabilities that have developed for self-driving cars. We'll uh, move on to the future proposition. In future, Tesla will be able to leverage the battery swap business model of NIO to expand in emerging geographies like India, Indonesia, Thailand, etc. Battery swapping technically converts the capital cost of the most expensive component of an electric vehicle, which is battery, to an operating cost. Separating the battery from an EV reduces the cost of an EV by 30 to 50 percent, thus bringing in at par with an internal combustion vehicle. Tesla will also address the high infrastructural cost and charging time by using BASS model. Tesla can also leverage R&D practices and intellectual property of NIO to help achieve its goal to develop an affordable energy and transportation ecosystem using solar energy. Eventually, Tesla will emerge as a global electric mobility leader and NIO's acquisition is a step towards it. Thank you. I guess we we'll move on to the question and answers and uh, switch on the form. Aman Indra, if you don't mind, can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, please, Rajiv. Yes, thanks. Uh, so guys, well presented, I think. <clears throat> like the present presentation overall, uh, in-depth analysis, so yeah. Uh, first of all, just trying to understand one thing, I think, I don't know, I didn't, or maybe I didn't pay attention at that point in time, but what would be the key risks involved in this MA? Like, you know, wanted to look at some uh, 
some pointers or you know a slide maybe but I, i know that you might not have it handy but yeah just just what's your understanding of the key risk because this i understand is a cross border mna as well so it will be fraught with some kind of risks for sure right so could you just elaborate on that please Sorry, I think uh, Vedika, you are on mute. Vedika, new. yes. So, sir, so we think the key risk factors will involve first will be the China regulation market. So, the China laws and regulation will affect how this merger uh, can move forward. And uh, secondly, sir, uh, how new? Uh, so, basically, there will be a very much cultural difference between how new is operating now and how Tesla is operating. So, basically, how these companies will merge together. And then uh, bypass these cultural differences to work together. So, so these two uh, major risks that I can think of. Okay. These are uh, uh, so very cutting. These are fairly generic, is what I understand. Like, yeah, uh, with regards to culture, I mean, any merger is uh, subject to you know a change in culture or something. But something more technical, if you could think of, maybe with regards to. uh their operations or the place of business or the customer base or i don't know i'm just thinking out loud so maybe with regards to that uh some pointers would have been helpful but yeah i mean that was one uh, question which i had uh, maybe indro or aman you all can ask anything which you all have in that we can indro you want to add or yeah short sure thing I'll, i'll i'll just have one short question so on page 6 uh, uh, are you going for a, a share exchange transaction here uh, yes sir we are going for a share swap deal yeah share exchange uh, so why not a cash transaction or why not finance it with debt yes sir uh, so why not cash transaction because when we look at the tesla's balance sheet uh, it does not have that much amount of cash and plus neo being a very big company as compared to tesla it is not possible for complete to completely acquire with cash and for uh, debt uh, i think tesla has already uh, raised uh, raised quite few amount of debt so it wouldn't be possible for them to you know it, it would be better them to uh, just swap the shares because the companies are operating in a similar industry and both will benefit from uh, gaining shares in each other this is what we thought Okay, Aman, you can go ahead. Yeah, so I had a few questions around this. So we did look at uh, Tesla getting uh, this this new acquiring Tesla, but did we look at other avenues? Why Tesla should not acquire the other peers that are there in the market? Uh, because when we compare to Neo, uh, we have the likes of Zping, we have the likes of uh, Canon as well, right? So there are other players in the market also which are very similar to uh, Neo, and at that point of time, in terms of valuation as well. when we see neo's valuation compared to other players in the market uh, that are relatively discounted so why won't tesla acquire any other company other than neo so yeah. so we uh, we start, we went ahead with neo because of the reason that we mentioned that because of its breakthrough innovation of battery as a service model which actually reduces the upfront cost of the car and makes it affordable for the customer and the customer can take up that monthly subscription fee of about 980 rmb per month and use it to customize the capacity of the battery vehicle accordingly neo provides the battery service options on call and they have their entire infrastructure with power stations and a mobile app which is easily uh, customizable to the need of the customer and which tesla can actually use across geographies to make a uh, to uh, leverage this technology in its other models as well so because of this major breakthrough which other companies did not have we went uh, we decided because it is future ready we decided to go ahead with uh, neo others can add maybe okay thank you mansi uh, but uh, if i have to tell you if tesla is also working on that uh, platform where they are trying to bring in battery as a service already and the research are on then then would your answer change uh, so for this we did research about tesla doing uh, tesla has already tested this model battery as a service model in past but they have not been as successful as uh, new uh, in a country like china which is uh, in terms of market is the largest market for ev in 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 the world so uh, for that uh, if neo is able to uh, tap into this market uh, tesla can use this uh, model across geographies like for example in india and other countries like india 
uh, wherein uh, charging infrastructure is the major concern for any company for any electric vehicle company so i think uh, battery as a service the success of uh, neo can be replicated in india uh, through tesla uh, this is what we thought and one more point i would like to add that tesla is currently in the testing phase whereas neo has executed 800000 plus uh, battery swaps already so it has that expertise and infrastructure ready so tesla can uh, make use of that okay so thank you for that and another question i had was regarding the deal structure that that you guys have suggested right you have suggested a share swap and that too not a full share swap basically you are leaving out 49% to the public as well for neo so why do you think a company like tesla would want to do that and not acquire the whole of the company and make it private why why would a company like tesla want to keep the hassle of keeping it public then going with all the regulatory requirements a public company require and specifically with a company in china where where the disclosures are very stringent no like not many things are available to the public why why a company like a tesla would want to do that so if i may uh, when we uh, look at this equity which uh, the new has new is listed as nyse as well so uh, when we go through the requirements of us securities as adr and uh, the chinese i think uh, tesla should acquire tesla should have a controlling stake which is which is what we thought and not uh, acquire through public because it would be a hassle to release the company and again uh, go through all the requirements uh, i think uh, the controlling stake will help tesla to you know control the company as and when they require and not uh, acquire 100% because it will again cost them uh, plus neo is not a profitable company currently and it has negative ebitda margin so it won't make sense to completely acquire them and maybe in future if tesla is having good practices and is able to you know pull out of the company from uh, this uh, negative ebitda and uh, negative uh, profit i think uh, they can look into acquiring public shares as well so this is what we thought not spent a uh, you know a large amount of money on this acquisition uh one more question is i am did it this was this answer satisfactory to you yeah yeah that was satisfactory you can go ahead rachit i have a final okay. question after that maybe our question may collide so yeah okay uh so one more thing from my side guys just wanted to understand right like you said that this is not a profitable company and from what i'm seeing on page 5 at the moment like it is one of the most expensive companies in this sector right because compare it with uh, great wall x ex- expangly auto saic right trading at premium valuations with regards to the industry for sure okay how would you, how would you justify this acquisition to the uh, shareholders of tesla right why acquire a non profitable company which is trading at premium valuations to the industry and what is it which uh, i think this is an overlap from what aman had asked earlier right what is it maybe that one or two key moats which neo brings in and which the others don't why you're paying this uh, premium as a uh, manchi has already explained this so we believe uh, what new can bring is some so it's a battery uh, battery as a service and automation driving as a service so basically a uh, not isle is trying to expand in emerging markets so for emerging markets that will need these kind of services as charging station putting up charging station is not always possible in a big country like india so if uh, t- new can provide that service to tesla tesla uh, tesla will uh, can acquire emerging markets very easily so this is this is the one of the most uh, that we are facing on so uh, why didn't we consider other companies because those technology or tesla has already those technology but this technology is new to tesla and it will help uh, him to expand into emerging markets so uh, two more reasons i would like to add is that neo's manufacturing facilities in shanghai it is actually going to be bigger than tesla's manufacturing facility in shanghai so it is actually in the expanding phase next point i would like to add is that the distribution channel the both of them follow same the customer direct to customer approach and neo already has that neo uh, neo homes which it has 38 houses globally so tesla will also get access to that and in addition to uh, 
yes in addition to that china is also looking to consolidate its market and it will it is looking to combine the smaller pay, players that is there in the market so competing against this consolidated one big player will be difficult for for tesla in china and china being a very uh, large market for ev home to 50% of the global ev market we believe that this merger will uh, will provide a strong foothold in china whose a uh, market share in china is already decreasing it has decreased from 6 to 12 percent so we believe that that this will help uh, uh, tesla in uh, by combining with neo in gaining a, a strong foothold in china by uh, because chinese preference uh, chinese customers also have a preference for uh, its domestic the company which is uh, selling domestic models that is why we believe that neo will be a good deal for tesla fair enough Um, if the judges don't have any more questions, we can move on to the next one. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well done, guys. Thank you so much. It was a very great presentation. Uh, calling upon the next team, uh, ingenious geniuses. Uh, if you all can please raise up your hand. Also. Participants are requested uh, to keep their videos on if possible. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, just uh, share my screen. Hello. Yes. I hope it's visible. Yes, sir. Above it is. Yes, Neha, you can start. Oh. So very warm greetings to our esteemed panelists and our other fellow participants. We are representing IIM Amritsar and would like to take you all forward towards a proposal for Alliance to acquire DMART. Indian retail industry has emerged as one of the most dynamic and fast-paced industries. As it evolves, a growing number of value-conscious online shoppers are reshaping India's e-commerce landscape. Food and grocery is the largest segment of the Indian retail sector, accounting for 66% of country's total retail. The retail sector is expected to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 15% over the next five years, whereas the online grocery space is projected to grow by 50 or 55%. Major growth drivers are the increasing per capita income, urbanization, digitalization, and the growth of the nuclear families. We have applied Porter's Five Forces model and observed that it is a highly competitive industry with high buyer's power, threat of substitutes, rivalry, and threat of new entrants. There are key market players like Reliance, DMART, Walmart, India, etc., with Reliance being at the top and capturing market share in groceries, followed by DMART. Moving on, we'll talk a little about the company. DMART, or Avenue Supermarts, as it is popularly known as, is an emerging national supermarket chain focused on value retailing offering a range of fast-moving consumer products, general merchandise, and apparel. With around 52% share coming from food and grocery, it has a promoter-dominated shareholding pattern. It has excess liquidity, which can be seen in high current ratio graph towards the right side of your screen. We can also notice a healthy net margin ratio with EBITDA margin increased by 30 basis points. Now, I would like to call my teammate Kanika to take you all forward through our rationale behind this strategic acquisition. So I'll be taking it through why Reliance would want to buy DMART. So as understood, grocery segment has a huge potential and therefore Reliance Retail, who earns 61% of its revenue from consumer electronics, want to diversify in this segment, majorly due to high profit margin in the sector and appealing growth rate of organized retail. So Reliance also witnesses an year-on-year -year growth of 48% on gross and food and grocery segment. So as seen from the table, DMART seems to be a strategic fit as it earns around 13k crores from groceries just through 214 stores, while Reliance earns nearly the same amount through 11784 stores. So currently Reliance also took some steps in this direction. It acquired future retail uh, because of its stronghold in grocery and fashion sector. And it also acquired 25.8% stake in Danzo, a company that delivers groceries online. So this was done to support the e-commerce bet of Reliance, that is Geomart. So Geomart follows an on-demand model where they don't have warehousing facilities, but they partner up with the retailers to fulfill the demand. So this helps them in saving up the capital expenditure, but it does not necessarily mean that they 
they'll be having competitive pricing. So for example, when you look at the discount range of GeoMart, it is around seven to eight percent. While if you look at its counterpart like Big Basket, Amazon Factory, or Flipkart, it is around eleven to twelve percent. So this is where Gmart comes, uh, Dmart comes into play. Next slide, please. So Dmart's mega size stores can be used for dual purposes. That is for stocking the everyday sales products as well as fulfillment centers to support the GeoMart. Then it will also help in providing a competitive advantage because Dmart follows EDLP strategy. So their prices are on a, on an average six to seven percent lower than other retailers. So this will help GeoMart to compete with huge discounts offered by online players. So the rationale here will be that Dmart has a very stable relative market share when compared to its competitors, and this can be attributed to its right business model. It has a low cost approach to retailing. It has competitive pricing model. It also attracts price sensitive customers. So it is best when it comes to focused target segments. It also has excessive liquidity with current ratio of 3.28 in 2021, which can be a catalyst in its expansion. Customers trust brand, lo brand loyalty due to Dmart's cluster-based expansion approach will be beneficial for Reliance. So it also has low-cost uh, uh, terms of trade and procurement, which will add on to the competitive advantage for Reliance post acquisition. Now, now I would like to call Weber to please take over. Yes, so I'll be discussing about how we did the valuation uh, for Dmart. So basically, we followed a top-down approach for valuing Dmart, and we did it in two steps. Firstly, uh, we projected the number of stores that Dmart is going to open in the future as per their annual report, and then we multiplied this with the average store size uh, uh, since the last five years to get the total retail business area in million square feet for Dmart. Then we found out the revenue per square feet for Dmart. Uh, by multiplying the revenue in the previous year, revenue per square feet in the previous year with the like for like growth of Dmart that has been there for the past five years. Uh, then we multiply the revenue per square feet with the retail total retail business area to find out the projected revenue for the next five years. After that, uh, we projected the operational expenses as a percentage of revenue. From there on, we got EBIT. And from the formula EBIT 1 minus T into 1 minus reinvestment rate, uh, we got the final free cash flows for Dmart. Uh, one second. So these are the final uh, free cash flows for Dmart. Uh, we did it using DCF and relative valuation method. So we got a share price of about 720 for Dmart, uh, which means it is trading at a huge premium as compared to its intrinsic value. The second thing we did is we found out the investment value uh, of Dmart for Reliance Retail, con taking into consideration all the synergies that Rel Reliance and Dmart have. Thereon, we got a share price of about 2200. The reason for this huge difference is because Dmart is spending a lot on capital expenditure, which is even more than what their EBIT is. So, uh, since they are, uh, so, so they are basically financing all of this with equity because their debt is almost zero. So that is why their ROC is very less. That is why the reinvestment is so high. And that is what is contributing to low free cash flows for Dmart. In the investment value, we projected that uh, Reliance is going to help Dmart open even more stores and at a low uh, low rate. Uh, so Reliance can basically finance all that uh, capex and that is why the share price is high in case of investment value. The next thing that we did is we basically calculated the NPV for Reliance Retail for this acquisition. So uh, we, uh, we followed four methods, GCF, Relative and Market Premium method to uh, value Dmart. So the composite fair market value of Dmart comes out to be 1600 and the composite uh, valuation uh, as per the investment value method comes out to be 2192 uh, for uh, Dmart. Uh, that is for Reliance Retail. So this is the NPV analysis that we did. Uh, in the first scenario, we've offered control premium to be 20% and subsequently 30 and 40 in the two, second scenario 2 and 3. So uh, reducing uh, this uh, acquisition price per share for all discounts as per due diligence and uh, other transaction costs, we get a total deal outflow to acquire it. That is Reliance Retail as 50,000 crores. So Reliance would have to pay 50,000 crores in the first scenario for Dmart. Now, if we subtract the present value of the investment value of Dmart to Reliance Retail, uh, which we calculated as 2192 into the number of shares Dmart has, that comes out to 72,000 crores. So we get a value of about 20,000 crores uh, as NPV for Reliance Retail uh, by acquiring Dmart in the first scenario, which shows that this, is, this would be a great deal for Reliance Retail. And as already discussed, grocery is a very lucrative segment as of now, and it has a high growth rate. And Reliance is looking to create a monopoly in that segment, but without Dmart in its portfolio, it would be really hard for uh, Reliance to do it. So that is our logic as to why we think Reliance Retail should acquire Dmart. Uh, that's it from our end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we move on to the question and answers. OK, 
Okay, I can ask a question uh, if someone and uh, that's if you don't mind. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so uh, if you look at uh, the offer uh, offer price range, uh, that would be between fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred. Am I correct? Uh, yes, sir. It would be sixteen hundred to twenty two hundred. Sixteen hundred is the yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know what the price of uh, uh, D Mart uh, yeah. uh, share is? Yeah, it's trading at around forty five. It's around four thousand, right? Yeah. So yeah, how yeah. how would you convince a shareholder to sell it at such a big discount? I mean, do you ever see a shareholder accepting it at such a big discount? Yeah, so that that is uh, what we uh, said in this DCF. Like we got a share price of about seven twenty for D Mart under DCF. So the thing is that D Mart is spending a lot on capital expenditure. The capital expenditure amount is more than their EBIT. What what their EBIT is? That is the reason for such such low values of free cash flows for D Mart. So that is why the share price as per DCF is so low for D Mart. The investment value, that is the value that Reliance Retail is going to have for D Mart, is still a bit higher, but that is also at a huge discount to their current market value. So that is what we are projecting. The D Mart is extremely overvalued as of now. So I am I am a shareholder, right? So I am yeah. not interested in like what uh, the capital investments of right. uh, the company are. I would be interested in getting a return on my investment, right? So how right. am I getting that if I if I am selling it at a discount? Okay, just to add to that, what Indranil is trying to say, it's a public company, guys. Okay. Right. Uh, so if you want to buy the shares, you need to buy it from people like us as well. Right. So if we have bought a share at forty five hundred, why would we sell at twenty two hundred at all? Uh, I think in that case, uh, the scenarios come into picture. Like we can increase the control premium that is to be offered. Like we've taken it as twenty percent in the first case. Uh, which is leading to an acquisition price of nineteen twenty one. So uh, uh, that is all upon the negotiation between D Mart and Reliance Retail. Also, uh, we've given only a twenty percent weight to the market premium method, which is basically based on their share price. So if uh, that is the case, the weightage of this market premium method can be uh, increased so that the price reflects the market price more. So, uh, so these two numbers, I think, this twenty percent and this control premium can be increased if that is the case. If the market price is a better reflection of the current status. In fact, guys. Um, so during the presentation, there was something that was going in my head, and I don't know if that's just flipping the case study altogether, but just why shouldn't D Mart in a way acquire the grocery business of Reliance Retail is something that I was thinking. I mean, you know, not not the other way around. You are saying that. Reliance Retail has a huge presence in grocery, and they use D Mart to just bolster that particular division in itself, right? Could you all like? I don't know if you all thought through, but just asking because it was going on in my head, considering where D Mart stock is and where it is projected to be as well. Not not just that because it's it's like it's become the holy grail at the moment, right? Over the last four five years. And it was an extremely successful IPO, and investors have made a lot of money. So, I mean, could you all like just on the top of your mind, like why shouldn't this happen the other way around? Just want to understand. I'm not uh, trying to you know put you under the throw you under the bus. I'm just just trying to understand your thought process. And you may correct me if you know I have missed anything or something. Or Aman and Indro, in case you all have some views on it, yeah. I mean, you all can also check. Uh, so, sir, the thing is, uh, the Reliance only has eight percent of share in groceries. So, even if demand goes on for uh, for the Reliance retail, it won't be a profitable deal because it won't make sense because Reliance earns around sixty one percent of its revenues from consumer electronics, and that is why Reliance is looking to expand in the grocery segment. On the other hand, if we look for demand, which is present in only in the western part of the country, and also uh, uh, the uh, has around fifty two percent of the revenues coming from grocery, so. Uh, only adding up around eight percent. Like, uh, if you see at the uh, look at the table, uh, Vipul, go to the next slide, please. Strategic rationale. 
yeah if you look at it demand has 214 stores and it has it earns around 13000 crores from groceries just from 214 stores and if you look at reliance it has around 11784 stores and it earns like a uh, uh, nearly the same amount from that that many stores so that won't be any sense to demart because uh, it can't go on and uh, you know uh, change the entire supply chain of reliance just for the grocery fair enough and just sorry now that we are on this slide and correct me if my understanding is wrong so demart has around 13000 crores of sales from groceries and has a market share of 22 odd percent whereas for a similar uh, sale for reliance retail the market share is 30 odd percent uh, is there a disconnect here or is my understanding somewhere wrong uh, sir actually when we include the 30 percent it has food and grocery but when we are uh, presenting you to uh, in the next table it is only the grocery segment it it does not include the food segment so it's not like for like right in that case yeah the comparison um Okay, fair enough. Tanika, when you speak about Dmart having two hundred fourteen stores in Reliance Retail, having approximately one hundred and eighteen thousand like uh, what? Yeah, one one eight thousand stores. Uh, don't you think there's a basic difference in the business model as well? Dmart works on the platform of a hypermarket or a supermarket, right? And whereby Reliance Retail is more kind of a neighbor store, which is around two thousand square feet odd for each of their stores. So the kind of a business model they are currently working on is totally different. Yes, sir. The, the business models are different. So we don't aim like uh, at uh, uh, like playing with the business model of Dmart. The only uh, benefit that Dmart will provide that it will act as a fulfillment center for Geomart because Geo what Geomart does it it uh, it fulfills its online demand through retailers like local retailers. It does not have its own inventory of warehouses. So Reliance will be needing that. uh if they want to fulfill the demand so since demarts are uh, uh you know they have huge size and therefore they can not only act as a uh, normal uh, supermarkets but can also be used as fulfillment centers so okay uh, just a follow on question maybe two parts to it okay firstly we are talking about using demart as a fulfillment center so uh, this kind of stores right this 214 stores won't be uh won't be closer to the locality or the neighborhood or the heart of the city stores okay this would be somewhat maybe 4 to 5 kilometers away from the each of the city stores and how does a fulfillment center work is basically having number of stores within very close vicinity so that you can fulfill orders timely so in that case the kind of business model dmart has won't really help reliance retail in terms of the fulfillment centers do you think that first question second question if we want we are saying that there is a synergy because dmart can help as a fulfillment center did we try and look at the likes of a more or a spencer or small uh, small stores in different cities like different cities have organized stores but they are not very well known throughout india as such so did we try and look at those companies uh so sir yes we did consider other companies uh but we thought that dmart will be uh, uh it because uh, it has the second largest uh, market share in terms of grocery so we want because reliance is looking towards a monopoly so we thought maybe dmart will be a best fit and if we talk about the fulfillment center things so dmart has also acquired future group and it has like a uh, uh, uh it it like we don't only have big bazaar in it but we also have other stores uh that are small smaller supermarkets so yes uh reliance will have uh, an edge from that too and maybe uh then the, uh, we also talked about the capital expenditure right that dmart is uh spending a lot on its uh building new stores so so reliance here can step in and uh, regulate where it wants to set up the store rather than leaving it entirely on dmart to uh, have it outside the city okay very fair fair enough uh, plus uh, and... dmart is also expanding in the online sector so we saw in the pandemic and i actually ended up ordering from it so i feel that maybe since dmart is trying to enter the uh, online platform so they might have some plan uh, in their mind like how they they end up fulfilling uh, these demands okay fair enough and when you talk about this uh, acquisition as such have we tried to look into what what can be the 
key pain points that Reliance may have trying to acquire DMAR? So, sir, the first thing is that uh, that DMART is just beginning to enter the online sector. So, uh, that is one key pay point, uh, pain point. Then uh, another thing is that DMART is only good for the grocery sector. So, uh, you won't get any benefits apart from the grocery sector from it. So, one other point is that DMART has its presence only in specified locations across India. So, uh, it has a lot of presence in the western part of India and almost no presence in eastern part of India. So, that is something that Reliance would have to work upon. Plus, we've already talked about the CAPEX point that uh, they're spending a lot and uh, that is going to be an issue for Reliance as well because they are the ones who are going to finance the further cap capital expenditures. Okay. Got it. Yep, that's it from my end, Rachit and Indriya. Nothing from my side. Yeah, nothing from my side as well. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had a small announcement for the participants. So basically, for the vote of Caspians, right now you can just fill anything and uh, just move ahead to the voting of genius and geniuses and then you can come back because there was an error while announcing the movement. So now we have uh, Team Caspians forward. Uh, could you please all raise your hand? Yeah. Akshay, can you share the screen? Are you able to see the screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's visible. Can we go into the show? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. We are Caspians from Ayam Kashipur, and we are looking at the possible merger of Lupin and Metropolis. And we found out the first analysis that we did was industry analysis, and we found out that the diagnostic market is roughly around 67.5 thousand crore worth. And there are three kinds of players unorganized players, hospital based players, and organized players. These players follow three kinds of business model hub and spoke model, shop and shop model, or home collection model. Hub and spoke model has a few collection centers and a centralized lab. These collection centers send the samples to the centralized lab to get tested. Shop and shop model is basically where these hospitals outsource these contracts to various diagnostic players. And in home collection model, samples are collected from your home and transported to a, co uh, to a centralized lab in a cold storage box. And there might not be any physical presence of a collection center, they're only a centralized lab. Then we looked at the market trends and we found out three market trends. The first is a lot of focus is there on the preventive and wellness services. So individuals get themselves tested these days without even a doctor's prescription to be on top of their vitals. And second, there are, there's a lot of brand building initiatives by these diagnostic players who are trying to invest a lot in uh, building their image and offering differentiated products in terms of, offer, uh, in terms of time and accuracy. And third, there was a lot of impact of COVID-19. 75 crore RT-PCR tests were conducted in the nation in the, last, in the last two years. And this put a lot of pressure on these diagnostic players. Next slide, please. Uh, then we looked at the competition for Metropolis and Lupin. And we found out there is a regional chain and there are new aggregator chains. Regional chains are bound by geographies, while aggregator chains have a massive online presence and are and capturing geographies through tie-ups with the regional players or national labs. And then we looked at the national chains of diagnostic centers. The majority three of them: Thyrocare, Doctor Path Labs, Doctor Lal Path Labs, and Metropolis. These 
catered to different geographies mostly that is how they are not uh, competing against each other in most of the geographies then we looked at the recent merger and acquisition and we found out that the merger and acquisition are to having towards having online presence and there's a lot of consolidation going on next slide please then we looked at the various uh, 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 company overview of metropolis and lupin we found out that lupin and metropolis are both run by second generation promoters and metropolis is an uh, old play in the market whereas lupin is backed by lupin india the pharmaceutical company and it's a new entrant and just entered in 2021 and we by this research we found out that india lacks a seamless uh, lacks a diagnostic chain which is seamlessly integrated across geographies and the market is going under a lot of consolidation and it's quite fragmented as of now and customers really like uh, to have a trusted brand when they are getting tested and they depend a lot on doctors referral when they, this is this, this happens and we looked at the challenges that the market is facing there's a lot of investment by pe firms to establish regional players which could grow out to become national chains and there's a lot of pricing pressure due to unorganized players and which leads to increased uh, competition to get more volume and there's a lot of technology as a uh, diagnostic centers has to tackle the technological advancements because as we a uh, uh, couple of years back we had to get rt pcr test conducted whereas now rapid antigens test can which can be taken at home can be a uh, substitute or to hitesh yeah thank you arsul uh, next slide yeah so when we are looking at the synergies from the merger first of all we look at the geographical reach of the two companies uh, we see that there is a limited overlap when it comes to the geographies that are served by these uh, two companies and it is a big positive for the merger at would as a uh, it would lead to less cannibalization of the common test and the services that they provide it will also strengthen lupin's position especially in west india and south india when it comes to the services offered lupin is mainly into the routine kind of tests while metropolis provides routine tests specialized tests as well as semi specialized tests so uh, uh, lupin can definitely get the benefit of metropolis's specialized and super specialized tests and also the margin is also higher in these uh, kind of tests further the merge entity will also see the benefits uh, in terms of the time and money that will be saved in establishing the systems and processes into the uh, for example if lupin has a diagnostic center then they can provide the similar kind of use the similar kind of processes and systems to provide the similar uh, specialized and super specialized test as provided by metropolis then there are cost synergies uh, in terms of variable overheads uh, uh, as well as fixed overheads being reduced by the merger so uh, with a small number of spokes and the technicians required uh, to serve the same number of customers uh, after the entity is merged uh, we, definitely there will be a reduction in the selling and administration expenses of the company as a percentage of their cugs and further the samples when they are collected from the spokes and transported to the nearest hubs so in, in, they are following the hub and spoke model so there is a lot of scope of reduction in the fixed overheads as well as the number of spokes can be reduced for sample collection further a uh, lupin's existing network using it metropolis can serve the b2b segment especially an area in which it has seen reduction in market share as well as profitability of late uh, then lupin and metropolis also have their own areas of expertise in diagnostic and they can uh, together they can capture a much larger uh, market share especially given the fact that they are presented mostly in different geographies uh, then lupin also has a good network of doctors as well as uh, referrals the same can be used for the easier customer acquisition after the entities merged Uh, next function you can take okay. so now talking about the dcf valuation for metropolis we have uh, estimated the revenues uh, based on the various facts presented in the annual report of the metropolis so we can see that the uh, metropolis is now focusing on a b2c sector and it uh, it already has a 58% of the revenue from the b2c in the past uh, financial year and now they are aiming towards 65% in the next 2 to 3 years also they are uh, planning to have a 90 labs and 1800 service points over the next 3 years and they are looking for the eight potential cities which are currently the selling cities and currently the revenue is roughly 20% from there so now they are also moving towards geographical diversification uh, also the revenue per patient the revenue per sample tests per patient home visits revenue also increased in the past 2 years and are expected to grow in the upcoming 3 years so accordingly we have considered the revenue growth uh, for the next 3 years for the 2022 to be 20% for 23 to be 21% and for the 24 to be 22% and accordingly we have calculated the uh, value 
which comes out to be 30,522 uh, millions as per the DCF. And for the uh, VAC calculation, we have used the interest coverage uh, ratio method and Damodaran's uh, risk premium. The one next would be taken up by Hebe. Yeah, so uh, in this slide, we're looking at the transaction multiple. Uh, so these are some of the most important transactions which happened in the diagnostic space in India. And uh, we use the EBITDA multiple and the average was coming out to be 44.53. Then using the last uh, 12 month trailing EBITDA of uh, Metropolis, uh, we came with an enterprise value of 13,271 crore rupees. Uh, the current market valuation uh, is around 12,900 crore. The difference being the premium for the synergy that the, uh, the companies are paying to the target firms. Uh, then uh, we also looked at some of the risks in the uh, in this space uh, in the in this particular merger. Uh, the regulatory changes, if there is any with respect to the upper cap, if it is uh, placed on some of the diagnostic tests which might not be affordable. Uh, if such regulatory cap is put, then it can definitely impact the revenue profitability. And further, uh, uh, the most common challenge, uh, uh, the uh, failure of integration of culture as well as the management may lead to uh, failure of capturing some of the synergies. Uh, then there is uh, also, if they fail to attract, train and retail the current critical staff, such as the pathologists and the laboratory technicians, uh, then it is also a risk for the merger, which is critical for running a diagnostic center. Overall, considering the market dynamics and financials, we think that Lupin can go ahead with the merger. And as for the deal structure, uh, we think that uh, an old st stock deal would make a lot of sense compared to an old cash deal. The promoters in Metropolis have been offloading some of their share of late. And uh, uh, there is also a, a risk when it comes to financing it through debt because there is not enough cash on Lupin's balance sheet. And it would constrain the cash required, uh, constrain uh, the uh, debt raising capacity of Lupin in the future for expansion. Uh, that's all from our side. Thank you. Uh, we can have the questions. Yeah. Well, guys, can you just put up the presentation as well, please? Uh, we might need to. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, just one small thing. I, I don't know, I couldn't find it on this slide. Uh, what would be the current, let's say, market cap or the per share price of uh, Metropolis and what is it uh, being proposed? Like, what is the merger or what is the offer coming into the That's something I couldn't find. So, could you just, if, there, if it is there somewhere, could you just guide me to that? Like, current versus what is being proposed? Yeah, so uh, uh, we have. Uh, calculated Just make it full the... screen, though, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, so we have calculated uh, the market value of equity and not like the per share price for the acquisition. But if you divide it by the number of uh, outstanding shares in the market. We can definitely this be, sorry 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 this market value of equity this three thousand odd crores if I'm not wrong yes 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 uh this is this is the current market cap right of Metropolis no this is as per our uh, this is as per your estimate and this would mm -hmm. be the takeover value is what you're saying uh no sir sir the takeover value uh would be the uh, would, would be according to the transaction multiple this value is taking into uh, consideration the possible synergies that we might get and the growth rate that would be there in case the synergies are uh, received by the company. So uh, this okay. is the value, 13,691. Okay, this is the value which you would be providing to the Metropolis shareholders, right? Yeah, yes, sir. What is the current market cap? So the current market cap is around uh, 12,900 crore. 12,900 crore. Okay. So you are saying a 10... 10 odd percent premium, not even a 10 odd percent premium. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. Okay. And could you all run a sensitivity analysis or something of the likes? Because considering that, you know, now I'm thinking more from the buy side, like Lupin's perspective, uh, the current market cap is, you're saying is around 13 odd thousand crores and you're also proposing a very similar number. Right. So, 
uh, like you said, I mean, I understand that you all have put the risks here. Uh, just a second, sorry. Yeah, you all have put the risks here. Uh, any analysis, let's say financial analysis, which you all have done with regards to the risks, as in what is the base case, upside, downside case? Or something like uh, how bad could yes, it sir. go? Worst case scenario, how bad could it go? Or uh, what yes, is sir. Uh, if we can share the Excel for that. Actually, if we can uh, uh, share the Excel. Sure, sure, sure. Can you see the Excel? Uh, no, Paksha, you are sharing the PPT. Well, it it was Let me know if you can see. Okay, yeah, I can see the Excel. But just, just help me understand how, like, I don't want to go through the entire Excel, don't take that much time, but just help me, get me to the outputs, like, in the base case scenario, what is the scene and what is the your broad assumption in your... Uh, yes, sir, so, in your, yeah. sir, for the base case, uh, we have considered the average of the past five years, the revenue growth for the base case. But uh, so, uh, but considering the various things mentioned in the annual report, we have changed our assumptions. We have not taken the average. So we have considered 20%, 21%, and 22% subsequently for the next three consecutive years, according to the various points mentioned. Okay. So, but if we go by the exit, this amount, these are all based on the averages. So, uh, if we go, for example, if we consider... How does the valuation the change, let's say, from bull to bear to base? Yes, sir, it would... Uh, so, it just would give change. me those three figures. Like, what is the bull case uh, valuation, base case valuation, and bear case valuation? Okay, sir. So, if it would be uh, bull case, then... Yeah, we can also change the scenario there in the data validation. So, sir, in that case, it would be 29,456 millions. That would be uh, roughly 2950 crores. Hmm. And in case of... Uh, 20, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sir, come down, come down. So, 29,456 millions. Sir. This is millions. So, huh, so that's 3000 crores, right? Yes. 29, and this is the bull case. Ah uh, yes, sir. In the bull case. Uh, but what to your deal value is happening at what thirteen thousand crores, right? In your PPT. Yes, sir. But sir, we are considering the transaction multiples for that and not the DCF. No, or... I mean see, see, try to understand something. Uh, Pakshal, if I'm, if I pronounce uh, yes, it right. Sir. Yes. Uh, whether you calculate through transaction multiple, trading multiple, or DCA, valuation is valuation, right? I mean, your the mm -hmm. method of valuation should not really impact the value that you're giving to the shareholders, right? Right, sir. So yeah, I mean that's what my uh, understanding was. Fair enough. I think I think that's it. From uh, I am done. I think Aman and Indro, in, in case you all have questions, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and then it is good. No, sure, I mean, go ahead. I just have one small question here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can ask it maybe. Okay, uh, could you uh turn okay, that's the page. Um uh, so if you look at uh the multiple for medlife, it's a bit on the higher end, uh the EBITDA multiple, it's around 71.27. Uh it's a bit of an outlier. I suspect it's because uh, it's uh, more of a pharmacy business rather than a diagnostics business. So any specific reason that you've included that in your calculation? So, so, medlife, yes. Uh, so medlife also offered services. That is why we kept it. 
and as you rightly mentioned that it also has uh, like doctors on boarded as well as pharm- pharmacies on boarded so that is why we believe the multiples were high but as you as you can see that in the last few years there have been push towards more online businesses so uh, we had only few uh, cases in that sense most of the uh, acquisitions happened on the regional level so we wanted something on national scale so that is why we do okay i mean just a small comment skewing your valuation to be a bit uh, on the higher end so that's that's the reason why i highlighted this uh, but okay fair enough uh, aman you can go ahead yeah just to add to it if you if you would have used a median instead of the average you would have actually landed somewhere around 25 26 so right now that 71 is bringing your average to a higher end instead of even even average you used a median there it would have landed somewhere around 27 for you okay so my question on this front was okay uh, firstly uh, lupin getting into the diagnostic space right uh, and we are trying to acquire metropolis for that matter have we tried to look at other players the regional players which have made a mark and also the likes of a healthians right why why won't a lupin acquire a healthians and try to acquire a uh, company like a metropolis uh, right now sir uh, metropolis uh, sir lupin is looking into metropolis because they want to increase their network of diagnosticians when they are tying up with let's say healthian healthian is a more of an aggregator where they tie up with digital players and sir uh, yes uh, yeah so if you look at healthian so yeah yeah you mentioned that it's an aggregator they started as an aggregator that's correct but now even healthians have nbl accredited labs that they have across different specifically across the northern regions they have have their own labs in the some part of middle middle india as well they have their own labs so they have moved from an aggregator based uh, model to a more more having their own labs for that reason so yeah so yes so that is to then healthian is more towards center towards north and lupin is basically do or increase the offline presence in that sense that acquiring a bigger name so as 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 well as more known for the pharmaceuticals than for the diagnostic centers so we believe that metro having the metropolis name under could give like uh, have a better credibility in terms of uh, let's say healthian person because we saw that there there was a lot of brand building activity going on so healthian is promoting this by marketing mostly while uh, having loop metropolis acquired it will be more word of mouth and trust that and the having trusted customers of metropolis coming to loop in brand so it will be a bit i believe so okay now just asking on that front okay when you talk about the organized sector which uh, which is majorly about four to five companies in the diagnostic space maybe a vijaya or a or a thyro care for that matter and dr lal path labs so when we compare metropolis to those kind of players uh, where does metropolis stand uh, compared to its uh, competitors in the market share space and since metropolis has been there for a very long time compared to even the likes of a Doctor Lal or somewhere. So, do you think Metropolis has been able to grow, and Lupin would actually be interested in acquiring a player like Metropolis, which is actually trading at a very high premium currently? Though in the last one month or so, they have definitely lost their market value. But yeah. So, Paksha, we go to the side where diagnostic slide. So, uh, third slide. uh so sir we did an analysis of uh, the various geographies like you mentioned and we found out that metropolis is mostly on the the own region so metropolis is on western southern uh, and we figure uh, found out that having like competing with dr lalpath lab or thyrocare thyrocare has been bought from easy so it's also have, becoming a uh, 
लार्ज नेशनल प्लेयर राधे न रीजनल प्लेयर पक्ष नेक्स्ट लाइक प्लीज एंड वी गेट वेरियस लैब्स एंड द काइंड ऑफ टेस्ट दैट दे डू एंड लुपिन एंड मेट्रोपोलिस पक्ष नेक्स्ट लाइक प्रीवियस लाइक in the one which we have lab tests uh so we looked at the number of lab tests that were done so we uh, so looking at this the lab tests that offered by lal patab is the highest whereas thyroke role few specialized uh, tests which are done every like which are common to most of the uh, doctors referrals so while metropolis has 4000 tests the number of 4000 tests offered so the number of tests are quite high compared to thyroke first thyroke so they have a differentiated their uh, stem cells their cells in the mark in that sense and so the currently the way where we think uh, metropolis is lacking is having a re, uh, like growing uh, grow they haven't grow, grown as fast as they should have we believe that so having lupin on boarded with this and have lupins uh, doc referral programs we think that metropolis could actually uh, take over the nation in that sense and become a fully national chain of diagnostic centers so we, that is what a problem we thought that there's no seamless integration between these diagnostic uh, centers across geographies so having metropolis and lupin together i believe it will be, help uh, metropolis grow higher and as you uh, as the question like metropolis has been there for a long yes it has been but it has not grown to its potential and we believe with lupin helping and it will be able to grow so one way out you are trying to tell me is that i'll ask my doctors who use lupin pharmaceutical medicines to only advise for metropolis tests correct on extensor sir so, because there is a referral uh, there is a referral program so we should take advantage of that and we got and as regional players are going like this why can't a national chain be born out of this got it okay that's it that's it for me स्क्रीन can we start oh, all right good morning jury members and fellow participants we are team movers and shakers welcome stakeholders to the shareholders meet we have important matters to discuss today it is time for reliance retail to expand and thus we will be dwelling on the possible merger of reliance and dima Let us start by discussing the growing retail industry. It is estimated to reach 1.5 trillion by 2030 from 0.8 trillion in 2020, majorly driven by the socio-demographic and economic factors such as urbanization, income growth, and a rise in the nuclear families, thus making India the third largest online retail market by 2030. Reliance Retail, as we all know, is the largest retailer in India in terms of revenue. its retail outlets offer foods groceries apparel footwear electronic goods etc the company reported a turnover of rupees 1.6 lakh crore in the last financial year tmart is the 33rd largest company listed on the bsc with a market capitalization of close to rupees 1.2 lakh crores well it is a very tough call considering the competition present in the market although based is the two major parameters profit percentage and market penetration dmart is the best fit compared to spar spencer future retail abg etc dmart has a clear edge over its competitors due to factors like first discount consistency and positioning as the one stop value store for price sensitive middle income groups second maintaining their operation cost at lower levels or building a loyal pool of vendors by paying them faster thus passing on the benefit to the customers 
Third, achieving best inventory levels by focusing on strategic product mix and refraining from entering the high-end products. And lastly, not indulging in expensive promotional activities that usually lead to lower margins. This deal is going to be a win-win as DMART will also avoid problems like competing with deep pocket players or deciding how to expand in the e-commerce market or, uh, or dealing with the overlapping of local markets. It will also help them grow faster, strengthen their supply chain for e-commerce and prevent competition in newer markets. We have Mr. Rohan, representative of Reliance Retail, who will shed more light to this matter. Acquisition of DMART will be the biggest investment for Reliance so far and definitely one of the largest the retail industry has ever witnessed. The, uh, to evaluate the impact of the merger, we have used the McKinsey's framework to establish synergies on three different levels using the levers of cost, capital, and revenue. Using the enhanced supply chain and logistic capabilities of the combined entity, we would hold a better bargaining power over our suppliers, thus procuring at a much lower cost. By reducing overlapping costs and leveraging better infrastructure capabilities, we would boost profitability and gain entry into untapped markets, thereby increasing overall market share. Using DMART's EDLC model, Reliance will gain entry into tier two and tier three markets, while DMART will leverage the robust supply chain of Reliance to expand into the north. The integration efforts will be managed by a separate team to make sure that the core businesses are not affected during this period of transition and all suppliers and existing stakeholder relationships continue unhindered. This will ensure that the combined business not only benefits from operational synergies, but also maximize from transformational efficiencies. Next slide. After thorough financial due diligence of the acquisition, Reliance Retail Ventures has decided to acquire 51% of the equity share of Avenue Supermarts from its existing promoter holdings of 75% to a leveraged buyout for a cash deal of 2.02 lakh crores. Post this acquisition, the promoter holding will be 24% of equity with the holdings of FIIs and other investors remaining unchanged. We calculated the intrinsic value uh, of the firm using the DCF model of valuation at a CAGR of 28%, but it came out to only 1.18 lakh crores, which is significantly less than the market value at 22.64 lakh crores. It also has an enterprise, uh, we also calculated the enterprise valuation using a sectoral PE multiplier of 23 times. However, both these methods include significant assumptions and the intrinsic values of the shares are much lower than the market value. So we financial, finally, we obtained a maximum valuation of 3.97 lakh crores that Reliance would be willing to pay uh, for the combined, uh, for not only for the market value of the entity, but also for the present value of the operational synergies available to the combined firm post-merger. This gives a range of about 4,100 at a bearish level and 6,200 at a bullish level for this deal. Now I pass on the baton to my counterpart from DMART, Mr. Aditya Tripathi, who will explain the parameters for acquisition. So we move on by defining the parameters of our acquisition that will make it a success. Um, a. As the McKenzie framework also suggests, the collective market share of the combined entity will be more than the two of us individually, since we won't be competing against each other. We projected it will be around 55% of the or, uh, organized retail sector. Secondly, as can be seen clearly in the maps, uh, both of us have different market strongholds and we at DMART have been particularly successful in creating a stronghold in tier two and three cities. The locations of the stores are also in residential areas for DMARTs, which differ from the mall setting of majority of the Reliance stores. Third, moving forward, Reliance will advertise itself as a premium brand in areas that have both a DMART and a Reliance store. It can also increase its margin on the products or segments that it has to comp be competitive in compared with other retailers. Then to increase its growth, DMART has uh, had recently considered compromising on the firm's basic tenets of not leasing. With Reliance bank rolling, DMART can conveniently advance its growth rate without losing the critical advantage of cost reduction through direct purchase. Even in the graph below, you can see that both DMART and Reliance stand out as clear leaders against its peers when it comes to gross margin and operation ex expenditure. We'll now move on to what the ideal business model would look like. As suggested, Reliance will align with SEC A, whereas DMART with SEC B and C and so forth. Our strategy is ideally based on three pillars. Number one, currently DMART sources 40% of its uh, re uh, requirement through centralized sourcing. The warehouses in which the companies would store fast moving items like grocery should be located closer to the clusters, while the warehouses in which it should store items like apparel should be located a little further away from the customers uh, for clusters to save on capital costs. 
we believe that as the scale of stores improves further centralized sourcing would increase and generate further efficiency second of all demart and reliance could follow a dual system for its manpower requirement by tweaking the current system used by demart number 1 hire key employees on their own payroll and number 2 obtain employees in uh, obtain employees in job roles where attrition is high on a contract basis which will also help to uh, keep the cost low aiming to be around 2 to 3% of the sales and number 3 pass on the benefits of low cost to customers in the form of low prices these low prices help to attract higher footfalls in turn leading to higher or faster sales and higher bargaining power and sourcing efficiencies translating into lower costs this will create a powerful virtuous cycle of growth as we look into the future we see that the trends align with e-commerce a segment where both the companies want to expand together they can be a tough competition to big basket amazon and others Dmart's lockdown scale up was 13,948.1%, which was significantly higher than even Big Basket. Some stores can even lease out space or be con- uh, converted entirely into fulfillment centers for their e-commerce operations. Dmart should add more click and collect kiosks. Apart from this, it can also ramp up home delivery pilots in Dmart dark areas to other neighborhoods in cities where Dmart's don't exist. So before concluding we just like to mention that the plan of action here revolved around BCG's five best practices for retail merger planning which are a setting a clear direction b ensuring business com- uh, continuity on day 1 c accelerating and maximizing energy capture d uh, mitigation uh, mitigating the risk of unrest and culture wars and finally managing interdependencies so mr rohan and mr aditya are we in synergy absolutely yes Thank you so much. We'll be sharing the financials for our stakeholders in the chat. Thank you. I'm sorry, Tanvi, I didn't catch you. Where were the financials? Uh... Um, yes, sir. We'll be share. So it's a separate Excel file. We'll be sh- yeah. It's there in the chat. Okay. If you want, okay. I can also share. Uh, yeah, we can also share, share it on the screen if you want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we prefer. <laughs> right sir sure. and just help us understand how it's flowing this is right sir yeah and before we get into that uh, you guys made changes to the presentation it seems uh because sir, the version please... that we got and the the one you presented were different sir uh, there is only one change in the valuation of the uh, intrinsic value that was reduced because there was some calculation mistake that we made which we corrected Okay, even the first slide, I think it was pretty different from what what you presented. No, 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 sir. There was just one change that was just due to an error no. on the part of calculation. That's it. We didn't change any other other slides. Okay. Uh, Rohan, are you presenting your screen? Yeah. So, uh, this was the DCA valuation that we did, and we found out that the intrinsic value uh, of Avenue Supermarket is much less than the market value uh, at 4140, which is currently at 4140. Uh, the DCF is currently at 1836. Uh, sorry, sorry, I mean, the value at 1836 is much lower. Um, as far as the valuation is concerned, we uh, give a maximum valuation uh, through the present value of synergies. So once again, uh, I'll just share my screen again. So uh, we used uh, different models to value the companies, but uh, we thought that since it's a profitable company, we would have to pay a premium to the shareholders to make sure that they give up their stake of 51%. That's why it's a much higher valuation than the market value itself. Uh, So given a bearish range, it would be around 4,100 and uh, bullish range around uh, 6,200 per share. Guys, uh, just one question from my end. How how did you calculate the synergy premium that that may be required? Do you have a calculation for that as well? Uh, I don't currently have a calculation with me, but uh, to calculate that, we uh, estimated the amount of synergy due to the increased market share. And uh, currently, the both combined firms have a uh, total revenue of uh, one lakh fifty thousand crores, and uh, estimating a ten percent synergy. We came out uh, at fifteen thousand nine hundred and three crores. Uh, okay. Okay. So help me understand why would there would be an incremental revenue because 
uh, don't you think there would be areas where they would be cannibalizing their revenue itself and not actually having been able to increase their revenue? I can understand on the cost part maybe, but how how will the revenues for both the companies increase if they merge? I will take that. Yeah, yeah. So, sir, we made sure that uh, in our presentation we also explained there are cities wherein we have both a DMART as well as a uh, Reliance uh, retail store. So, we made sure that they do not cannibalize each other by segmenting the two stores differently. Reliance right now also serves to the middle class or the upper middle class per se. It can move on to reduce its margin in that segment because in a lot of uh, uh, electronics that sells and other things, it has to reduce its price to match that of other retailers. It does not have to do that anymore because let's just say if I'm in Delhi and I have a retail store for Reliance and I have a retail store for DMART, I, if I have to go for a low price, I'll go to DMART. And if I have to go for a better price, I'll go for a, a higher price. I can go to Reliance. It depends on the customer segment. So it won't be an overlapping of the segment as such. If I have to go for EDLP, I'll go uh, to DMART. In the same city, they won't be cannibalizing each other. So basically, Aditya, you're trying to tell me that I'll have to run two business models simultaneously. And I'll, as a brand itself, even though I'm saying that I have acquired DMART, but my price points for Reliance Retail is different and my price point for DMART would be different, correct? These are in only cities where both exist because we do not want cannibalization. There are cities where only one of them exists. So where we can use a, a model of EDLP for Reliance as well, but we can't, we do not want to uh, reduce any assets or re reduce the stores and uh, turn them unprofitable. So that's why we want to keep continuing with the same model since both are strong currently. So again, on that point, then we are trying to say that for each of the cities, we'll have a different business model. Do you think that's really feasible from a company's end, which is like such a big company to have different business models for each of the cities? Uh, again, sir. So this is going... The idea of having a two, two different models does not come into picture unless and until these two companies did not have only, uh, robust uh, supply chain models on their own. If they did not have that independency, like for example, uh, Reliance acquiring Future. Future was about to be liquidated without Reliance, but DMART and Reliance can hold up on their own. The fact that they come together is to make sure they have a market monopoly or they dominate the market and not about how different models uh, for that matter will affect or will hinder the performance or growth of the individual companies. And we, I, we wanted to show it through graphs as well that individually also they can provide, they are 29% and 22% respectively. So functioning them individually would also not uh, be a hindrance. And uh, depending on different cities, as we move forward, initially, since we said that we do not want there to be no business continuity on day one, we want there to be business continuity on day one. On day one, you can't just change everything, uh, uh, every business model for that matter for, uh, for every city. So we want to continue with that. And as and when we see the growth and any changes in the market, we'll move along with that. And so there's one more small point. So basically, DMART and Reliance, they will be catering to different market segments as well. So that is why this is a... a you know, overall, it's a good opportunity for DMA to also, you know, uh, align itself with Reliance since uh, they and for Reliance as well, because they will be initially they will be able to, you know, uh, capture a larger customer base as well, because the customers belong to different segments. Okay, now I'm a bit confused on that. Okay, now when we talk about that, okay, so why, why would DMA actually want to do this? Why would they want to? have the name of such a big company like a reliance on its cap table and lose the control over its stores because 51 percent goes to reliance right so why would a company like dmart would really be interested in doing that when it's able to perform on its own they don't require any support it's not like a future retail or a big bazaar where they were into uh, they were not doing well and they were going to get liquidated. So that was the reason. But for a company like DMART, which is very good in terms of cash flows, in terms of sales, everything, why would they actually want to get acquired by Reliance? Then? So, so one of the reasons that we mentioned in the presentation as well, in the beginning itself, was uh, that even in the projections of DMART, the last two years, the last two years uh, for every market has, for every company has gone down. But uh, future projection did show that Reliance will face a stiff competition with the advent of uh, Amazon and Reliance both getting into the Indian retail sector. And that would be a big hindrance for them. 
secondly they are currently operating and uh, they want to expand in e-commerce and we know that e-commerce will be the future of uh, retail um it will expand in a big way currently dmart is operating only in five cities and it is unable to sustain that even so using the existing uh, supply chain of uh, um reliance and geo mart they can both expand uh, together for the e-commerce sector as well can you move to the slide tanvi where we mentioned those three points yeah so there were the three points that we looked uh, forward to that is number one competition which was making a significant change in the business model uh, to go big on e-commerce secondly that deep pocketed players like amazon reliance uh, they will definitely dominate and local markets were uh, kind of overlapping especially when you talk about vmart in even two uh, tier 2 and 3 uh, cities uh, dmart was facing a competition through vmart or uh, uh, and others so we thought that uh, a synergy created by both of them using the uh, deep role of uh, deep so, pockets of room bazaar and room lock karenge using the deep pockets of reliance and using the existing strong edlp model of dmart they can both come together and be a dominant in the market and did you guys try to look at what would be the key risks involved in this if we try to acquire dmart is yes, uh, the key risk uh, that we fear was that since dmart is a profitable company the main risk could be to uh, like uh, get the uh, like the promoters to sell their equity so that's why the price has to be very high and post acquisition of dmart since dmart is a very uh, well known brand uh, we we don't want to change the branding or anything so that the customers who are currently Uh, shopping at dmart they don't uh, change their uh, like buying uh, patterns by associating a reliance name to that so we want to keep the same business model and just uh, operate in the same way yeah. and my final question uh, and maybe indranil and rachit can uh, further ask on this but uh, did you try to look at other key players that may be acquired instead of just dmart and why not not a, like of a spencer or a vmart or even for that matter if you have heard about v2 retail uh we did uh, analyze and that's why we put it uh, put a competitive landscape so we analyzed on two parameters that was profit percentage and high penetration um considering spencers our main concern was that it shares more more or less the same market that reliance does so it won't be providing uh, reliance with anything new when it comes to entering into new markets that is of two tier 2 and tier 3 cities uh furthermore spencer cannot match the prices that dmart can and the supply chain of spencers is also uh, comparatively weaker than dmart uh, other competitors on the landscape that we have put face the same problem um and their profits also have been going uh, down and this we have also uh, mentioned this graph can you move ahead can we uh next next yeah so this is what a graph that we had uh, which was pure wise gross margin and cost of retailing so if you compare uh, here as well dmart and reliance are the two which have the um lowest of the opex but the gross margin that they can have they have is uh, very high compared to all the other market key players and this was one of the reasons that we wanted that this could be a viable and a feasible uh, acquisition which could provide both the companies with something that they do not have okay that's it from my end uh, towards the end there is one suggestion and comment that i would like to give you guys but i like uh, indranil and rachit to complete first uh, okay uh, could you move to the financial stage okay uh, so you are recommending an lbo for dmart uh, do you know what the target uh, leverage is uh, for reliance by any chance so uh... we haven't uh, really done like that would be so a... i'll tell you i'll tell you i'll uh, tell you so it actually boasts of a net debt zero commitment so having a net debt of zero so when you acquire a uh, dmart for 2.02 lakhs uh through an lbo that puts a that puts quite a lot of debt on its balance sheet so how do yeah. you justify that 
sir uh, we went for the leverage buyout because dmart will be providing a sufficient uh, incremental cash flows uh, throughout the coming years and that would be uh, enough to uh, pay back the uh, to find like uh, pay back the debt uh, and the interest portion of the uh, from that so since it's a, a continuing business and it's a very high uh, return generating business we thought lbo would be uh, providing better returns overall uh, but for the short term don't you think that like if you look at the value of acquisition it's 2.02 lakh crores which i suspect will not be very very different from the gross debt that is present on reliance's balance sheet so how do, how do you think they'll justify it for the short run um i think that's something like uh, i didn't want uh, reliance to go ahead and again raise equity because they have already gone through so much uh, financing through equity i i thought it's a better option since it's a very high uh, revenue generating business that they're acquiring that uh, it will be easier to pay back and then uh, once they pay back it will be a much better return uh, on their okay pay. fair enough Uh, nothing additional from my end i think indro and aman have asked all the questions so maybe aman you you can go ahead with your suggestions please yeah so guys uh, firstly uh, i think uh, you guys wanted to make it interactive uh, so this would be a suggestion for everyone so when we are talking about investment banking right here and you are trying to propose an acquisition to reliance retail you really can't have both the both both the clients on the one platform because you can't tell dmart that reliance is going to acquire you that needs to be very sensitive first reliance has to make up their mind and have to come to a conclusion that they are going to acquire because both the companies are listed so i agree that you guys try to make it interactive for the people here and try to do that but in the investment banking space we really need to be very cognizant of the fact that this thing can't be uh, done at the first level itself so having dmart board as well as the reliance board on the same call when we are discussing about acquisition is not something that is usually done it's just a feedback from uh, for all all of all of the people who are there on the call sir uh, just to uh, point well taken sir but uh, just uh, to clarify this was just uh, we wanted to it's not the first meeting that uh, reliance and dmart would be having this is just to it's a shareholder they are addressing the shareholders that this is what we have been planning and this is what the future uh, headlines like. yes okay. thank okay, you that's uh, yeah. yeah thank okay. you so we'll much move on to the next team yes uh, so then next we have uh, team house of lies um, Could you all please raise your hands? Yes. Now we start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are the team House of Lies from Iam Kashipur. So let's try to understand the landscape. We are focusing on the acquisition of Reliance uh, of uh, DMART by the Reliance Retail. So in a nutshell, what are we looking at here? We are looking at the quick commerce channels or the omni-channel growth and the multitude profit opportunities which will arise after this acquisition. taking the uh, uh, seeing the current industry profiling we see that almost a 50 plus percent market share is held by dmart and the reliance retail in their respective categories uh, as per uh, fiscal 20 data then almost 40 percent of these uh, the customer base of these two companies are residing in tier 2 3 4 towns in india and there is an overall 45 percent projected increase in the retail market over uh, next few years in india so there is a huge growth scope which is evident in this market then checking the uh, company profiles uh, we see that reliance is already a market leader in groceries and it has uh, several consumption baskets and there are a lot of brands 
uh, which are uh, which it caters to uh, depending on the uh, consumer needs then it's uh, again a new co uh, commerce initiative it has been taking some initiatives to strategically link producers with small merchants so that it gets a, a cost advantage across its supply chain then we look at dmart's company's profile there are different categories and under single roof uh, whereas in reliance it was uh, different brands for each category uh, then the uh, typical consumer uh, basket at dmart is uh, very cheaper compared to the peers and the break even point for each store is only 24000 per day then dmart is known for its region specific inventory and so on so what is the feasibility uh, recently we see that reliance has a, a, a very high uh, brand name because of which it was able to raise almost four, uh, 473 billion dollar uh, 473 billion rupees for a 10.5% stake its debt to uh, debt to issue, uh, debt equity ratio is uh, very low at 0 0.4 so it can have uh, it can have higher debt on its balance sheets and so on but uh, there's a, a bottleneck which will uh, we will have to mitigate that is reliance and dmart will have a dominant position in the industry after this uh, transaction is done so this may not be approved by cci uh, because it will be a, it will become a monopolistic market in the coming years next please so uh, we try to see how the product market fitment will help uh, create a new synergy for these two brands so to understand product market fitness let's first understand the market we have so market in the market there are two types of customers one are those people who are looking for a higher cost advantage and who are very brand loyal then there is a second set of uh, customers who is the, at the other side of the platform that is who is looking uh, that is the shop owners so or the local kirana stores which is increasingly becoming a very huge base for uh, both the companies to service so these are the two segments which are uh, which currently represent the market and uh, at the both ends of the spectrum uh, we uh, reliance is well positioned to serve the customer needs then if we see the product now reliance is a very trusted brand name it has high location availability because of its different format stores then it has a strong digital presence because of geomart and then it is targeting heterogeneous customer segments not just one customer segment uh, just like dmart is so uh, there's a market, there's a product. Now to understand product market fit further, uh, let's check the uh, fitness in, with respect to DMART. So if we see a uh, product usage of DMART and Reliance, uh, it's almost uh, DMART is second preferred grocer in India, whereas Reliance Fresh is third preferred grocer. Then in comparative analysis, we see that uh, over the last few years, the, there have been several generations of uh, competitors which have been developing from first generation, which were basically uh, based on brand reputation so that's easy day to now fourth generation which is entirely based on quick commerce we've seen a lot of uh, new innovation coming up in the space so to uh, leverage this new innovation uh, the reliance already has an ecosystem in place and dmart has a supplier base in its uh, supplier chain in its uh, base so if both collaborate there will be higher synergies then uh, other major benefits are like it has omni channel capability bargaining power is will be very high once it is done, then there will be high store density. It's already very high at uh, about five. And then assortment availability is almost 88% across both the format of stores. Then uh, if we see the rule of 40, NPS score of Reliance is already 46. And there's a 13% uh, profit margin and 24.7% CAGR of the Reliance retail uh, since, uh, since uh, last two, three years. So even the rule of 40 is satisfied here. So we see that there's high product market fitment for the Reliance. Uh, uh, system. Next. So finally, we come at the strategic feasibility of this deal. So there are four parts of this strategic feasibility which we check. First is the store overlap in key districts. Key district because uh, most of the retail, organized retail in India is segmented uh, towards the western part of the India, that is Maharashtra, Gujarat and so on uh, in those states basically. And within those states, only seven districts account for 48% of DMART store. So these districts are over retailed in terms of uh, retailing. And uh, whereas for uh, Reliance Retail, it's spread across uh, throughout India and uh, its store density is much higher than DMARTs at 5.7. So we have a few options here. First option would be that we could shut down some of the operations in some of the stores for DMART when we acquire it. 
or maybe convert it into dark stores for quick commerce or maybe start targeting a different customer segment if we see the customer segments then realize is already doing that already having that strategy in place where it targets different customer segments and it has different brands for doing that in category differentiation part uh, but before that uh, let's move to uh, digital presence of geomart we see that the online retailing is expected to grow or is expected to become almost 10% of the total retail from 4% in 2019 to 10% uh, in 2024 and india's uh, smartphone shipment has also uh, will also increase tremendously uh, this is highlighting the penetration of digital services so dma does not have any uh, digital presence yet however reliance has one digital stack ready and uh, it can use it to serve uh, dmart's customer then the combined share is uh, all, almost more than 50% and they'll have a higher bargaining power with the suppliers which will lead to increase in revenue per square foot then coming to the category differentiation part reliance follows a, a strategy where it has multiple brands to cater to different categories and each brand has a different customer segment it is targeting to uh, whereas dmart is a value retailer and it is only uh, primarily category uh, ca catering to low to middle income groups so dmart's business model and reliance business model are different so based on what this uh, acquisition might look like in the future they can choose what option do they want to take it uh, next yeah C uh, coming to the evaluation of dmart we have assumed the uh, pro projected sales for next upcoming 5 years based on the projected growth of stores uh, dmart stores according to the mda analysis and uh, in the uh, in avenue supermarts annual reports and uh, and uh, conducted a dca valuation based uh, and for, for the cal calculation of vac we have uh, assumed the risk free rate uh, according to 10 year uh, government bond rate and premium according to uh, damodaran's and so uh, according to this analysis that dmart's avenue supermarts current uh, uh, intrinsic value comes to around 2 lakh 17 thousand uh, crores which is uh, about 50 to 60 thousand le lesser than the market market ma market capitalization so uh, and to next we analyze uh, analyze the uh, value the synergies and based on the future scope the future scope uh, of the of this merger uh, is uh, is evident in three key results that will help uh, and benefiting both of the both of the companies. First result is pole position of reliance retail in FNG segment to yield higher scales of economies and further en enhance the top top line performance. The second result is it will be the dominant player in the omnichannel retailing with with uh, command capabilities of GeoMart and DMart. And the third result is uh, using uh, this uh, in increased spread of geography and uh, uh, and uh, different consumer. Uh, um, groups which are available to target quick a quick commerce segment which is projected to grow to 5 billion market by 2025 so to uh, to value this synergies we have taken the geographic overlap between reliance and uh, dmart uh, dmart stores and gro groceries and uh, as mentioned about uh, converting some of the stores into dark stores or uh, closing them all together all together where uh, there is a higher density of uh, higher density of uh, gro grocery stores and uh, similar target segments will be achieving uh, cost cutting and as a result of uh, uh, increased market share the, the companies will have higher growth than the uh, than the, uh, than the sum of the parts and and by entering into quick uh, quick commerce uh, the strat uh, uh, due to the strategic synergies will will we have further advantage and by com combining uh, these three synergies uh, we have estimated the total synergy at uh, the present value of total synergy at 56000 crores so the maximum offer that can uh, that can be of, uh, offered by reliance retail to dmart is at 270000 crores which amounts to about uh, 43 4390 market price which is higher than the current current uh, value, uh, current price of dmart so this this is this is a, this is a win win situation for both uh, uh, shareholders of D Avenue Supermarts and Reliance Retail, and the deal will be financed uh, in an all-stop deal with uh, sh share swap ratio of one one is to one point seven six. And in the, uh, if we look at the uh, uh, for the next five years, the shareholders will see an EP EPS accretion due to increase uh, uh, increased retail increasing retail pie. 
So uh, this these are the reasons why Reliance Retail should acquire Dmart. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, guys. Uh, had a few questions around. I'm just letting you open it now. Page five, I think, of the Dmart valuation slide. Can you just open that too? Yeah. Uh, my actually have two three here, so let's do it one by one. How did you all calculate the beta here? Do you think that a point three beta for this industry is slightly on the lower side? Uh, for uh, for the uh, for the entire retail industry, the point uh, the beta uh, uh, comes uh, comes to around zero point eight seven. But we have taken uh, I, uh, we have compared the competitors in grocery retail. And uh, based on that, the, we have got a lesser beta than the entire retail industry. Uh, which all competitors did you take? Like that's what I'm trying uh, to understand. How did you calculate the point three? So uh, we have Spencer Retail and uh, and many other uh, modern retail uh, localized modern retail trends, model uh, retail retail chains. Like uh, there are uh, uh, Ratnadeep, which is uh, localized in uh, Bank uh, Karnataka and. Uh, there is a chain called Ratnadeep, which is, uh, is local. Uh, yes, sir. Ratnadeep. I think it is listed under a parent company's name. Uh, so, uh, and uh, there are several other uh, uh, several other uh, localized competitors, and we also taken uh, 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 existing uh, value. Existing analysis of retail industry and based on that we have taken this. Okay, so in my understanding, I think the beta is on the lower side. Okay, your beta should be higher, firstly. And secondly, even though this is debatable, I think a terminal growth rate, from what I understand, is presumed to be around 6%, right? Yes. Uh, fair enough. I think that's debatable, but I think it's on the higher side. This is on the higher side, right? Uh, third, yeah. yeah yes, sir. So, uh, we actually we, uh, terminal growth we have consciously taken on the lower side because uh, uh, because the competitive scenario, if you take the Amazon is entering into physical stores and with increasing uh, investments into Walmart, the the retail industry, grocery retail, can go either way. So uh, we have taken, uh, uh, we have lowballed it uh, so that we will get uh, a conservative uh, figure. Sorry, I am not saying that you have lowballed it. I am saying that it's on the higher side, the terminal growth rate. Because see, understand what the concept is here. It's it's to grow terminally, okay? So it's not like a three-year, four-year, or a five-year. This is still infinity. So. Beyond six is unimaginable, like for any industry to go to, to grow that long forever. Okay, of course, there would be years wherein you would have a 20% growth rate as well, but over the long term, till let's say for an infinite period, 6% debatable, but on the higher side, that's fine. It's okay, I understood your point. And thirdly, and more importantly, if you see the present value of terminal value. Right, it's around two lakh seven thousand crores as against your enterprise value of two lakh seventeen thousand crores. So, from what I understand, most of the value of DMART you're saying is being captured in the terminal value, right? That's around ninety-five percent of the value, enterprise value is coming through terminal value, right? Again, I mean, this is not a new age firm. DMART is not a new age firm, right? So what happens is for the new age firms, this is fairly okay. Wherein you say that, you know, maybe three years, four years down the line, most of my value is lying at the back end. Here, it's a fully established cash flow positive firm, right? With good margins and, you know, I understand that it's in a growth phase and rather it's doing a lot of capex at the moment, but it's okay. I mean, still, I, I think you're, uh, model would have changed had you, you know, just paid some attention here as well, because I think if you change the beta, the growth rate and the two, three metrics that we spoke about, right, maybe this figure sli gets slightly better. But just keep this in mind that the present value of the terminal value has, your most of your value can't lie in your terminal value is what I'm saying. Right. It's not a future-oriented firm. It's still doing good business in India, right? Like, 
probably one of the better forms over the last 3 4 years for the investors so yeah two, those were my two three comments maybe indro and aman can go ahead. yeah yeah just to continue on what rajit said that ratio should like ideally be a, between 75 to 80% not more than that uh, i suspect uh, what you could have done over here is you could have actually broken up your capital expenditure into maintenance capex and uh, expansion capex and your also your uh, capex ultimately should converge with depreciation it should be 100% depreciation not more if you had done this then you probably would have got a better uh, present value of fcff uh, anyways nothing more from my side aman yeah just to add to it guys uh... also one more thing that i saw was your cost of equity is very close to your cost of debt so i was not sure how is that happening uh, because ideally your cost of equity would be higher and the cost of debt would be lower uh, actually 8.7 uh, yes yes uh, i think uh, actually it is uh, cost of equity is higher uh, may uh, the the latest version is not reflected it is closer to around 10 point something in the excel file uh, so the source got uh, disconnected here i think okay 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 so yeah i think uh, those were in front of this and uh, in terms of the synergies uh, can you go to the synergy slide that you had prepared right so did you guys have a very detailed analysis on this cost synergies gross synergies or it was just a percentage assumptions that you have taken so uh, for uh, the uh, we have taken different scenarios Uh, of the combined firm where uh, individual firms and the combined firms were uh, looked at the industry trends and uh, uh, taken increased uh, increased market share and tran- translated into growth and uh, we have re- uh, taken re- uh, reduced cost percentage so uh, it is not too detailed but uh, uh, v- based on the project uh, future projections and uh, in the uh, different articles and uh, uh, and the respect to companies Uh, md analysis we have taken the expected scenario synergies okay got it and when you say about deal financing you are trying to swap shares with reliance retail correct so how did you arrive at the value of reliance retail for the deal swap so we, for reliance retail also, retail also we have conducted the same uh, uh, valuation and uh, based on that we have arrived but don't you think that would be much more dependent in terms of the current valuation because you can't have a forward looking valuation for reliance retail and then have a swap uh, ratio sir oh uh, no no sorry uh, we uh, swap ratio is ba- uh, swap ratio is based on the current market prices but uh, the synergies we have conduct uh, synergies we have valuation based on the uh, uh, intrinsic value of reliance retail no no so i'm talking about the swap ratio how did you get the value of reliance retail reliance retail is not listed right so uh, are we have taken the uh, uh, we have t- taken the uh, valuation of rrb reliance retail ventures limited okay have... got it and okay, these yeah. yes yeah. these synergies uh, this valuation makes sense because if you look at the entire retail uh, grocery retail pie over the next 5 years still uh, may majority of uh, the tier 2 uh, two plus cities uh, come from the uh, unorganized retail where the sec bcd uh, uh, customers w- w- will focus on uh, only only on cost ca- on pr- price sensitivity so uh, where reliance currently does not play so uh, the these growth synergies make sense uh, despite uh, different business models so th- that's all uh, we have to say thank you okay got no no that's very helpful yes thank you team house of lies uh, requesting all the participants to please adhere to the time limit and also keep your answers very crisp and short uh, yes so we'll have the next team that's the 11th hour you can start presenting is the screen visible can the team confirm uh, yes on hand okay so we start a very pleasant morning to the judges and everyone present here we team the 11th are here to present the acquisition strategy 
for lupin next slide please lupin limited is an indian pharmaceutical firm that ranks amongst the top 10 generic pharmaceutical companies in the world and for which we have analyzed metropolis as an acquisition target after which we came up with an alternative solution to acquire 51% stake of dr lalpat labs at a premium of 10% from the current market price of 3080 because while metropolis is a good fit for lupin to expand its footprint in diagnostics inorganically but acquiring dr lalpat labs will provide better synergies and that are expected to arise from the deal next slide please to explain a strategy let's first look into the industry in which these companies are working the healthcare industry it consists of hospitals pharma insurance diagnostics and medical devices let's understand the diagnostics market a little better as a deal is focused on that the market size of the do uh, domestic diagnostic market is 9.5 us dollars and is expected to grow at a cagr of 11% over the next 5 years the urban market which makes up 65% of the market share is dominated by chains of labs and the rural market is which is 35% of the market is dominated by unorganized lab with our suggestion we plan to focus on the un urban diagnostic market and create synergies by increasing the geographical presence of lupin now i would like uh, ronny to take it forward um uh, yes uh, could you move to the next slide anand yeah it is in the lupin slide yeah, yeah thank you so let's first look at our acquirer company that is lupin so lupin is a major pharmaceutical company however it has been facing some struggles in the last 5 years so if you could check the you could look the we are uh, sales so it's stuck around 1.41% and it's uh, underperforming on all metrics compared to its peers so it makes sense for lupin to venture into the diagnostic business uh, to diversify its risk also to bank up on its existing doctor relationships because uh, majority of the uh, diagnostic sales are still through doctor referrals so they have actually set up uh, diagnostics in december 2021 and it's mainly in the state of maharashtra and headquartered in mumbai so they set, set up a lot of labs under around uh, in west india around in maharashtra and the plan is to expand into south india in the next 2 to 3 years so but uh, we believe that lupin should not go at it alone uh, uh, and this is why because uh, geographic expansion is a uh, is a is, is a major worry for uh, these kind of uh, kind of uh, this industry because it is very difficult to establish trust in new areas and also scaling uh, the major uh, the margins are because of higher volumes so uh, it is important that you scale up and scaling up in this particular industry takes a lot of years so that's the reason why we suggest that lupin should partner with a major diagnostics chain uh, like uh, dr lal patlets so over here our uh, case had provided the company uh, metropolis uh, which is a leading diagnostic company however they are majorly for uh, present in west india especially uh, in maharashtra and all uh, like 57% of their revenues come from west and 20 to 25% of their revenues come from south india and also they uh, the major segment is from b2b as well so we believe because of these uh, reasons because lupin already has good connections and already are uh, catered to west india we believe that my metropolis won't be an idea fit and we are going with lal pat labs which is majorly present in north and central india and uh from where in from north india it has around 60% of its revenues and again it is a b2c catered model around 67% of their revenues come from the b2c side uh and it's a leading diagnostic chain in uh, india okay so uh, on the left you'll see the competitive advantage mainly the pricing so uh, on majority of the test lalpat has the lowest prices so in fact they haven't raised their prices in, in like in the last 4 years so if you have a option between a lalpat and a, and another chain uh, and lalpat offers uh a uh, cheaper rates you definitely because there there's not much difference uh, in fact lalpat has lower turnaround times as well so basically if i as a consumer i'll definitely go with lalpat and they are able to uh, provide uh, services at uh, low rates compared to its major competitors and again there's there are benefits of scale uh, again so uh, one is uh, of course a good uh, trust with the uh, with the consumers and with uh, doctors as well as well as Uh, uh obtaining uh, raw materials and supplies for, uh, for cheap so on to the next slide uh, we'll be able to see the financial side of uh, lalpat so five year revenue growth has been at 50 uh, has been at 15% uh, profit kagar around 50 17% and even its roe roc numbers are also solid um coming to the shareholding uh, the uh, promoters uh, hold around 55% of the shares and uh, foreign investors 
uh, share of the company has increased around 6% over the last two years, which is a good sign. Uh, commenting on the liquidity, everything looks solid. It's a zero debt company. Uh, the working capital is sufficient. Even uh, the efficiency has been rising as the cash conversion cycle has been uh, dropping over the years. Over to you, Anand. Thank you, Ronnie. So quickly telling about the strategic rationale of this deal. So as Ronnie mentioned, uh, there is a good uh, uh, headroom for growth for Lalpat Labs as they're also having the same plans of expanding to South India and they've got a good brand equity. And another important factor is they're uh, are no, they are known for their turnaround times and home collection services. It is noteworthy that home collection is not something as easy as your Amazon delivery. It is a specialized task. And presence in that segment is actually a good uh, strength. And of course, they cater to the B2C uh, B segment. So in order to quantify these advantages with Rupin, we arrive at the revenue synergies in terms of customer acquisition, wherein Lalpath can leverage on Rupin's doctor network through referrals. And uh, they can all expand their B2B business share. And in terms of uh, scaling, you get to uh, reduce your prices due to economies of scale, which again, adding to the elasticity, you can get further uh, more market share along with your uh, geographical complementation. In terms of cost uh, synergies, two, there are two important things. One, in terms of reagent rent rental model, your uh, cost of materials as a percentage of sales will improve. And your employee cost is also likely to uh, reduce because uh, uh, Lupin Diagnostics can actually share the uh, labs of Lalpath Labs instead of starting its own. So that is the advantage of your hub and spoke business model. So we, uh, as a small guesstimate for uh, assuming that you're going to uh, share the labs of around 70 to 80 labs of Lalpath Labs, you, are, uh, you can arrive at a figure of around 0.3 to 0.5% of uh, cost synergy. So uh, coming into the numbers, we did a receive valuation of Lalpath Labs. With the, with the growth drivers being their B2C segment market share and uh, their expansion into South India. We are expecting 12% CAGR for the next uh, uh, five year growth and a further 6% uh, growth rate for the five years. And uh, 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 with uh, I mean, with by doing the DCF, we are arriving at a uh, intrinsic value of around 3,100, which is uh, with clubbing with the kind of sensitivity analysis, we can say it's not a, a big undervaluation. It is almost at par with the market price. And we can uh, come up with acquisition, sorry, I mean, uh, stake buying plans uh, in terms of premium to the market value. And we also did a DC evaluation for Lupin. Actually, there's a purpose for that. And of course, in, uh, for D2C, uh, for, for Lupin, uh, their uh, drivers are basically their API segment and recovery in the US sales. So uh, here it is noteworthy that the, the promoter holding in Lupin is around 46%. So they have some room for using their equity shares to uh, buy the stake in uh, Lalpath Labs. And their intrinsic share value is around uh, 911, which is again not a big difference when compared to your market price. So coming to the uh, deal drafting, we thought of two cases. One is a 25%, 25, 28.5% stake, and another is 51% stake. And uh, still, uh, your debt to equity ratio in 51% stake is still, uh, I mean, reasonable. And for funding this deal, we can use uh, debt cash and equity. Equity in the sense, the 10% of uh, shareholding of uh, Lupin can be offloaded to uh, buy the stake and it can be actually given to Lalpa's promoters as to reap the uh, long-term benefits of the deal. And uh, in order to do further analysis, we uh, wanted to see how much synergy is realized in terms of net profit. So here you can see that uh, the uh, net profit synergy is actually lesser than the initial years, which is because your finance cost will overtake your cost and revenue synergies initially. But however, uh, in the long term, your uh, synergies will be improving. And in order to add more confirmation to the transaction, we did an accretion analysis by comparing the standalone EPS of Lupin and standard, I mean, and the uh, EPS growth of your merged model. So here, here you can see that uh, the EPS growth, five-year CAGR of EPS is actually very high when compared to Lupin's standalone EPS. So which adds more conformity to the transaction. So here we would like to sum up that uh, than Metropolis, both qualitatively and quantitatively, Lalpath Labs is a best fit because you get an opportunity to kind of uh, being the monopoly in the organized chain of uh, diagnostics. And uh, yeah, the deal can be funded uh, partly by cash, debt, and uh, equity. So we would like to conclude. We, we just made some annexures by seeing the geographical capabilities and uh, the past uh, transactions. Thank you. Uh, shall I go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, so guys, uh, to be honest, I was a bit lost uh, throughout because there are too many things going on in the presentation. So can you please summarize what are the key points strategically and what are the key points financially? Why should Lupin not acquire Metropolis and acquire Dr. Lal Labs? Okay. 
Okay. So, Rani would like to tell or yeah, I, I, I'll do the uh, qualitative part. Uh, so, our, our logic was that Metropolis is based in Maharashtra. So they have set up a lot, lot number of labs in Maharashtra. And Lopin also has, has his headquarters and a lot of labs based in Maharashtra. So, geographically, uh, a better complement would be Lalpath in that in that case. Also, uh, the B2B segment for Metropolis is strong. Uh, they are still looking at the B2C side. So they are, again, uh, venturing into a B2C side where Lalpath has a good customer uh, service experience among all the diagnostics chain. So where uh, Lalpath, uh, where Lopin can help Lalpath is in the B2B side with its doctor connection. So these were the two major uh, reasons why we chose Lalpath over Metropolis. And also Lalpath is a main bigger player and scaling up is important in this business in order to drive up margins. So that th this, this was our logic uh, qualitatively. So even in terms of numbers, you can realize better synergies when compared to your uh, metropolis. And uh, the deal is not very uh, different in terms of debt. Yes, there are, the metropolis is actually a cheaper deal, but still uh, when you come uh, compare the benefits, uh, Lalpath is actually more reasonable than metropolis. Okay. And can you go to the slide where you had price comparisons with different players, right? You mentioned that Dr. Lal Path Labs is better priced than its competitors in terms of tests. Uh, there was a slide on tests. Yes, yes, uh, that is the slide. Okay. Yeah, but when I see this, that when we compare it to the like of a Thyrocare, which would be its closest and the biggest competitor currently, I think they are almost priced 30 to 50 percent, and in some cases even 70 percent higher. So how, how do you think that would help Dr. Lalpaz curtail the competition in the market? Because to be honest, uh, if the kind of reports and diagnostic people are getting is similar uh, at each of the platform, the only consideration that comes into aspect is the price point. Okay. Uh, I would like to take this up. So basically, Thyrocare is not as big as uh, Lalpath, not even like five times of the company. So. With, with the kind of scale, actually, this price difference is not much as well. Uh, Thyrocare has uh, their competitive advantage into general, I mean, all these routine tests like thyroid and all. So when you're considering an expansion in terms of scale, you, are, you are also have an opportunity to use your economies of scale and bring down the pricing once you get your Pan-India presence. So with that, uh, the competition uh, that you're getting from Thyrocare will be minimal. And of course, their geographical presence is not as comparable to Lalpath Labs. Also, majority of the revenues are from general routine, wherein the price is 500 versus 600. And also bundle tests also, if you look at the number of tests offered and the base prices also, uh, Thyrocare comes around 1,000 rupees for 12 tests. And uh, Dr. Lal has offers more, more number of tests uh, in the base prices as well. Okay, but uh, to be honest, those numbers can be like the test profiles. To be honest, can be really inflate, inflated, guys. So, uh, uh, Doctor Lal may try to show a suppose for an example a lipid profile, right? A lipid profile will generally have six tests under it. Uh, the Doctor Lal Path Labs may show those six as different tests, whereby a company like a Thyrocare or any other competitor may just show it as one test. So, yeah, there are there are obviously the way of showing it, but oh, okay. Got it. Okay. okay. I think, uh, yeah, that's it from my end. Uh, Nothing, no such questions from my end. Okay. Uh, so, have, yeah. um, so, have you by any chance uh, gone through the, like, uh, the share price movement of uh, Dr. Lal pa Path Labs? Have you checked... Uh, how uh, it's been performing in the market. Yes, I, actually, after we uh, did the submission, I think we got the Q3 results the so, uh, day before yesterday. And we had a 3% de decline uh, of share price yesterday. I think it is going, I mean, it's trading below 3 thousands. But why? But that's not only because of the result. I mean, uh, it's it's been happening for like about 4-5 months or so. Why do you think that is? I mean, investors are not very happy with Dr. Lal Path Labs, at least for the medium term. Okay, I'll help you out. So, uh, you know, there's this recent acquisition that Dr. Lal Path Labs has gone for. Yes. Uh, acquisition of uh, suburban uh, diagnostics. Yeah, right. 
and uh, it's taking a lot of time to actually digest that business and it's not being perce- perceived well in fact uh, market says that it's uh, currently dr lal pat labs is overvalued now when you go and acquire dr lal pat labs not only is this business a bit overvalued according to the market but there's also significant amount of investment that you'll have to make uh to acquire like to actually integrate uh, suburban diagnostics into the business like, why not just buy metro life and just uh develop that instead of going for uh, like double almost double the value of metropolis but when we think i mean, as in like if you take out the capabilities of metropolis and uh, lalpat labs it is kind of uh uh one they they have a like their labs are just 50% of what lalpat labs is having so even though we kind of pay the double, i mean twice the it's not actually twice the price it will be a bit lesser but still if you acquire by, by paying a larger amount uh, still uh, you get to reap uh, larger benefits that is uh, what we were able to think of so that so in, in the initial years yes that will be uh, actually a bit difficult to realize that much of finance cost and all but still uh, as in long term your synergies are going to improve right so with that you can balance it off okay okay thank you team uh, we'll move forward to the next team we have the final team as the finance group so yeah just Krishna, can start. Yeah. Oh, so your screen. Yeah. Can anyone confirm if my screen is visible? Ah, uh, yes, it is. All right. Thanks, sir. Ah, uh, good afternoon, jury. Today we finance Max, a team consisting of my teammate Krishna Vadwa and myself, Samrat Chaudhary, are here to discuss why we believe Tesla should acquire Neo. Ah, uh, there are currently more than forty EV players in China. However, as we are speaking. Neo remains the most significant market player with a domestic market share of around 25% in the EV market. Its techn- technological synchronization and customer centric service is what provides it a competitive advantage. Tesla, which currently has around 17% market share in China, faces risk like uh, uh, competition from domestic players, expenses for matching standardization in the battery market and lagging SUV appeal in the market. we believe that acquiring neo will help tesla overcome these challenges and provide it access to eastern and southeastern geography with a technological superiority it will also be a gateway to utilize many china based patents and innovations across the globe hence this acquisition will be a strategic fit for tesla next uh, we also analyze the reasons and risk associated with this acquisition coming to the top reasons tesla can leverage neo's tech space and uh, use it to improve the customer experience for example it can use nomi which is a virtual car uh, in car assistant of uh, neo and also its social media space neo is also a leader in battery swapping uh, service uh, which currently tesla lacks somewhere tesla currently has more than 2000 supercharger stations in china and neo has around 200 battery swapping stations in china so integrating these two will be highly beneficial for tesla as it will uh, be able to charge or replace the battery in less than 10 minutes however as we are uh, discussing this there are also some risk associated uh, like the current uh, like the current uh, with the current acquisition like the overvaluation of neo uh, decreasing government subsidy in china with time um the current battery glitches which uh, in neo batteries and international geopolitics and the unstable trade relations also in order to make this acquisition profitable we suggest establishing market dominance and expanding the range of cars initially and then um, expanding internationally into other markets with enhanced technology and product line we would be discussing the path to profit uh, profitability in an upcoming slide as well so uh, we can say that we see these two companies not competing with each other in china but 
as working to, uh, together to drive the ev industry in china and globally uh, krishna do you know right right so jury in order to evaluate if neo is the right fit for tesla or not we devised our own proprietary framework which we call as dept framework wherein we compare neo with other close potential targets which we are going to discuss in the following slide in a very objective and rational manner we listed down five parameters and 15 sub parameters on the front of financial operational strategy technology and culture from which we believe tesla can drive synergies from uh, the uh, from from neo and we uh, rated uh, these each sub parameters uh, we assigned respective weights to each sub parameters and rated them on a scale of 1 to 5 so the identified targets were nikola neo rivian kanu and li auto basis which we did uh, assign scales on the sub parameters identified uh, as per the dev framework and, uh, uh, and 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 called out the weighted average scores so as as you can see in the scores so neo came out to be ranked number 1 with a with a cumulative score of 4.18 Uh, followed followed by Rivian and Li Auto with with the scores of three point nine nine and three point eight one respectively. Jury on the right side, a top right side, we also did a maturity assessment basis the framework itself, and we as uh, highlighted in the green, we can see that Neo is on the right end of the spectrum, spectrum which we believe is is the is is a perfect fit uh, for uh, for Tesla going forward. Jury coming to valuation, we adopted a. Uh, we adopted the average of following three methods which is dcf forward revenue and ebitda multiples to arrive at a valuation of 53.7 billion usd which has been elaborated uh, in the next in the next slide so uh, we believe uh, the dcf valuation of 39.1 billion at a 9.2% vac is tad higher than its existing uh, market uh, enterprise value which gives tesla a, a, a minuscule upside of 2 to 3% We even conducted a tornado chart and a Monte Carlo simulation on the valuation to be sure of the methodology before presenting it to the Tesla's management. Basis the key inputs. Uh, our valuation is most sensitive to terminal VAC, uh, revenue, CAGR, and expected synergies parameter, as highlighted in the red box in the slide. Uh, going forward, when it comes to the deal structure, we uh laid down an illustrative uh, deal range uh, for the tesla on the left of side of the screen we plotted uh, the guiding range for tesla's management for the deal wherein the lower spectrum which is highlighted in gray is the as is uh, market value of neo and the upper blue segment is the maximum uh, uh, recommended uh, range for tesla by us wherein we believe the middle range is uh, uh, as highlighted in the green is the zone of possible agreement which which is somewhere between 38.16 billion and 52.08 billion uh, enterprise uh, value uh, we recommend tesla to secure the acquisition uh, to secure the acquisition to a mix of diluting its excess liquidity current excess liquidity position in cash bridge financing and backup uh, line uh, backup credit line wherein jury we believe neo should uh, acquire uh, oh sorry tesla should acquire neo with an intent of getting it delist in the future to leverage the delisting gain which would translate into accelerated synergies which has been uh, factored in the synergy quantification slide in the in, in the following slide uh, sam over to you for quantifying the synergies thank you um next slide please thank you yeah. so from our valuation model we were also able to show, uh, show the synergy gain arising from the acquisition so as you can see on the in the graph on the right we estimate a 12% higher revenue and a 19% higher ebit uh, by 2026 due to the synergy thereby taking the overall revenue to 14.2 uh, billion dollar by 2026 uh, as our estimated value the two companies can collaborate and produce synergy from various aspects which we can see uh, uh, on the right on the right side of the of the slide this includes the supply chain synergy which is by leveraging their existing logistics operational synergy by entering into new markets and eliminating any uh, duplicate or redundant cost by merging uh, their best practices and leveraging the each other's uh, technology brand name and talent it can provide an enhanced customer experience and a better ev adoption globally next slide please okay so for a successful acquisition 
we uh, created a post acquisition plan for tesla which we further divided into six phases so we believe that for the first two phase it should sing, uh, synergize its product and services identify various customer clusters and uh, their response uh, their, their corresponding needs from the ev sector hence majorly focusing on market penetration strategies the next two phases should then be prioritized towards cost optimization and synchronizing expenses and um, increasing the focus on innovation technology uh, technological patents technical superiority primarily in the suv segment where tesla currently uh, lacks a bit and also in the premium car segments um, yes and once this is done the firm can focus on expanding to other uh, geographies like the east and southeast asian market the european market with its new offering and the uh, enhanced product line so thank you the, uh, this was the presentation from our end uh, yeah. you are now you're open to question uh, just a minute before uh, the question and answer happens i would like to remind the participants that the form is uh, open for more, at most 5 minutes now so please fill in the forms you will get to 3 minutes extra after this team particular otherwise uh, please fill in the forms and close the forms so you can start like the questions uh, shall i go ahead and then you let me touch it yes please yeah so firstly guys uh, nice presentation and krishna i need to tell you i've got a very good background i like the background of your home if it is that that's the case but yeah now getting into this uh, firstly i see further two new slides uh, which i don't think was yeah. in the pack that was presented to us uh yeah. so uh, that's a point but uh, uh, can you go to that uh, dcf valuation slide once yep yeah. so my key question is if you look at 2026 uh, the ebitda that you have taken why it has dropped even though the revenue for the company is increasing yes uh, so essentially oh, oh. Yes, so Jury, I I believe uh, it's it's a uh, it's a it's an uh, I would say accelerator. It it is essentially increasing uh, because we have taken a CAGR of uh, terminal CAGR of twelve percent. So it is idly increasing only. I'll just recheck into the Excel uh, yeah. if that's the case. Because idly, I believe the number is two five zero three rather than one five zero three. Okay, uh, you should look into that because I'll tell yeah. you what. i think you had also given the excel so in the excel i think there is an error in terms of the cost assumptions that you have taken for cox right just try to have a look at there uh, sure. due to this your whole valuation will actually change and not what is currently presented right. so just try to have a look at that the second query was in the previous slide if you can go to the previous slide why are we trying to uh, compare neo with the likes of a nicola and rivian Uh, so just to give you a background nikola is more into semi trucks right semi uh, right. self automized trucks and uh, that is the reason and rivian is into muvs not suvs or something rivian is into muvs as such so why are we trying to compare neo with the likes of a rivian or a nikola and not someone like a zping for that matter right so uh, jury essentially Why Nikola? Because we also studied the current as is product uh, portfolio and future plans for Tesla. So Tesla is, if you know, Tesla is coming up with a new product range which is called Semi, in in uh, potentially to be launched in financial year 2022 or 2023. So that is where we saw those synergies of of uh, uh, synergies kicking in for Tesla uh, in alignment with its future plans as well. So that is where we we uh, we also considered Nikola. But if you see eventual rank for nikola is fourth out of the five competitors that is because uh, this is uh, the the operational fit the product fit so we believe it's on a lesser side but just in order to have a peer comparison and not go straight into one let's say one target given which is neo and not compare it with other peers we wanted to have a, our population sorted picking nikola was primarily due to its uh, the the tesla's plan to enter into uh to to launch semi and synergize on uh, semi trucks kind of product portfolio and what about rivian 
similarly rivian also we believe uh, tesla lags big time when it comes to muv as an suv so rivian brings that muv segment wherein we believe that neo will uh, get us get the suv uh, lead uh, to to tesla so just in order to have a comparison we we, we consider uh, rivian as well because uh, we believe that it is also one of the uh, let's say it it could be potential uh, targets for tesla uh, so okay countering that uh, suppose you would have taken a uh, i'm not sure if you did that analysis on a zping for that matter uh in that respect zping is very close comparable to a neo as well as a tesla in terms of their offerings right and also how they do the production uh, is very comparable to a tesla so would you think if you would have taken zping for that matter i'm not sure <laughs> if you would have the numbers and everything but if you would have taken zping the whole chart would have been different and maybe neo would have been taken okay. back yes agreed we could we could have taken new zipping as well but we wanted to consider let's say as per us what were the closest five competitors or like four competitors uh, plus neo this is what we taken but surely we could have taken uh, zipping as well okay so i think we took uh, like uh, of course like the number could have been different in that case but like we considered li auto and like um, uh, it is also on the similar okay. line so uh, yes got it Okay, uh, I think that's it from my end, Indrani and Rachid. Nothing from my end as well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, very, very comprehensive, guys. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing further. I think Aman did cover most of our. And Aman, if uh, needed, we can uh, like share the updated Excel uh, in some time. Uh, with that. Uh, no, no. Actually, I'm not sure what will the valuation look like. So I did go yeah. through the Excel, and I did see. So there are further, uh, further gaps in the Excel as well. Maybe uh, we can have a look at that. But yeah, the, so basically, the thing is, Krishna and uh, the Excel. The way you have made it is you have taken a decreasing trend in terms of the cost of goods sold year on year. But usually, that's not yeah. how that would have happened. but yeah obviously right. that's uh, you you guys are trying to do it on a preliminary way and much not of an information so yeah, yeah that's fine that's fine yeah so jury we had a call we we recently had a call auto analyst call with our uh, even a call with our city analyst uh, friend as well so the intent was to if if you know when as and when tesla and neo synergizes we we were expecting the cost to grow drastically lower post 5 year that was the let's say background but yeah agreed it's on a very preliminary basis and uh, while on ground the uh, reality could be like different yeah thank you yeah thanks again thank you so oh, okay like stop the share i think there were a good deal of presentations and um, after this so uh, we're going to have the judgment round so i'm sure that the judges would have an extremely tough time deciding the winner among such pitches uh just to uh, remind the participants uh, we're going to close the form in 2 minutes we have not received responses from two colleges so reminding you once again and uh, i would now like uh, request our judges to move the breakout room to decide who would be the winner of makeup pick so
hello guys uh, so as we are waiting for the results uh, i would like to uh, so uh, this there is actually no beach pool competition going on uh, beach pool festival uh, boating competition going on a day to compete so you guys can go to this link and uh, vote for our college fest as you guys are uh, a part of it
Sorry. Yeah, I was on mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, okay, I'll go on. So, uh, uh, we have the results ready and uh, hearty congratulations to everyone who participated. Uh, so I'll be announcing the results uh, in the second runner-up. Uh, in the runner-up position, we have a uh, team 11R from IIM Raipur. And we would like to extend a hearty congratulations to them. And on the first position, we have a uh, team finance group from IIM Bangalore. Uh, so, yeah, everyone could like Please congratulate the entire team. And uh, just a minute. Uh, we have been working tirelessly to come up with various interactive events. So we would like to thank the judges and participants. I would like to congratulate all the winners of Make or Break. Uh, this year, we saw firsthand exciting talent and innovative thinking that all the participants possessed. I wish you all kudos for that. And to each and every national finalist for Make or Break, I want to tell you that uh, there are two words that we at SP Jam are abide by. It's been courage and heart. The meanings of these words are delved deep within each of us. And I request all of you to enjoy this journey that you all undertook. It was our pleasure to provide you all with the platform to showcase your talent. Wish you all the best. And I would request the judges and the uh, uh, finalists or the winners to stay back and the others could like join. Maybe all could just like switch on your video so that we could take a screenshot. Yeah. So can I just smile? <laughs> Okay. Uh, Purvi, just one second. I'll spotlight the runners yeah, yeah, up yeah. and the judges first, and then we'll uh, the same we'll do with the winners. Okay, sure. I think we're forgetting someone. You're forgetting. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'll add the runners, uh, sorry, winners now. Thank you so much, Jajas and the winners. Well done, guys. Thanks a lot, Pulvi. Thanks a lot, Jyoti. Well organized event. Again, you're on mute. I request the participants to stay back for a while. And, uh, yeah. Thanks. So we'll drop Thank off. you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you yeah. so much, sir. It was really uh, great having all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, if it okay. if you could uh, uh, if you could spare a few minutes, you'd like some like feedback of the event. Uh, I've taken it. Otherwise, yeah. like if you want, you can like if there are specific questions, you can go ahead. Otherwise, like receive the feedback. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all the uh, participants you're supposed to wait. Uh, give me one minute, I'll get back. Would you have added the form in the chat? Okay. So, um, just a Yeah, so uh, we've uh, there's a form that has been uh, circulated. You guys need to fill in your details in this for the prizes. Congratulations, by the way, guys.
uh guys only one person from each team uh yeah. can fill the form please do just ask the the whoever is the captain please 